Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show once again tonight. And we are gathering on this Thursday evening because we've got more draft stuff to get ready for. We are two weeks away officially now. We are actually two hours short of two weeks away. We are almost there. And I know people are getting sick of all the pre-draft stuff. People are getting sick of the mock drafts. I'm getting that sense. I think people are just ready to see what we do instead of talking about what we're going to do. So we're almost there. It sneaks up on you a little bit. It is sneaking up on us just a little bit. But the NFL draft is almost upon us. And we did a really good job over these last few weeks covering the offensive side of the draft, I think. Did a really good job. Covered every player almost. So now, now we got to turn our focus to the defensive side of the ball. We're going to start that off today. And we're going to wrap up before the draft gets here. So I am joined by Brandon of the Hawks Nest. How are you doing tonight, Brandon? I'm doing wonderful, man. I'd love to turn it over here to the defense and look at uh, the potential guys we'll be adding to Mike McDonald's scheme. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to kind of work our way back here. And I think we're going to get right into it because not a lot's been happening. Seahawks are using their top 30 visits. They're having a couple guys in pretty much every day at this point. Uh, some interesting things you can learn from that, but you also know you might you might end up drafting like three or four of the guys that you used to top 30 visit on. So you, it, it, trying to parse too much meaning out of those things can be a little bit of a fool's errand, I think. I ran the exact numbers on the last three years in regards to this very matter, Brendan, and to your point, and I was at 8% as far mm -hmm. as the uh, people we bring in versus what gets drafted <clears throat> in right. the top 30, top 30 visits. Yeah. And logically speaking, you would probably use top 30 visits on guys that you're wondering about, right? Not necessarily the guys that you love, because the guys you love, you're just like, yeah, I love that guy. I got nothing to ask. But you might use a top 30 visit on a guy that you're like, well, I like him, but I want to know this. I want to see this. So you, you, a lot of those visits probably just go with them going like, yeah, I'm not too interested in that after all. I, th I think you're right. I don't think uh, it, it's a variety of reasons for why you bring the guys in here. You know, it could be one little thing that you have as far as the lack of understanding about the player that you just want to kind of lock in. It could be the true just blue, you know, we have interest and we're just, uh, you know, want to get any last information we can. But here's even another one, Brendan, which is one John Schneider talked about today on 710. And that was the, hey, what if we sort of set the stage up a little bit for down the line with maybe when we're going to bring in for agents and bring right. these guys back in where we're not going to have the opportunity to draft you. We're not going to be picking high enough or we won't be in the position to pick you. But if you do come back to free agency, you, you'll remember this culture. You'll remember this building. You'll remember the the nice vibes maybe that you resonated with. And maybe we can, that can give us a little bit of a, a nose when it comes down to some negotiations down the wire against free agencies uh, a couple of years down the line. I thought that was interesting. John said that. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's, it makes sense why you do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we did hire a new coach the other day, uh, Keaton. Uh, did you see anything about that? I didn't uh, Didn't pop up on my news source stuff. So. Yeah, we hired an offensive assistant, uh, Keaton, former Utah State quarterback, um, been bouncing around from college program to college program. So we're giving him his first ever chance in the NFL as a coach. But there isn't much to say. Like last year, he was an offensive assistant for – uh, Marshall. Okay. And the year before that, he was a running back coach for Utah state. And then he was a graduate assistant at like three different other programs over the course of like five years or something. So there's nothing really to say there. It's like, it's an offensive assistant. We're trying to launch his career that, you know, will end up going up until he reaches a point where that's the peak of what he can actually get done at the NFL level. You can't have too many uh, offensive minds in the room, man. Too many got people trying to come up with some good ideas. All right. So with not a heck of a lot going on other than that, I think we should just hop right into these defensive linemen. You ready for that? You ready to go? Let's go. All right. So um, I'm not in love with this draft at the top for defensive <laughs> linemen. No, it's not. I, it's not. It's not blowing up a dress, man. I think the body is nice. I like the body. And then the legs are pretty all right. But the top, like the head, it's just a little bit small. It's just a little bit underwhelming to me. I mean, last year you had, of course, Jalen Carter and you had Kalija Kansi. I think both those guys would clearly be the best 
defensive lineman in this draft. Do you agree with that? Oh, yes, absolutely by far. Yeah, so that being said, there are currently two guys that are being hyped to go in that first round. And uh, believe me, I definitely agree with the people who will say that, hey, we don't need defensive linemen. We stacked our defensive line up too much already. We don't have room. But at the same time, I think we need to keep an open mind that the team might do anything because this is not a great roster yet. We need help in a lot of areas. And if they feel like the best player available at their pick at 16 or wherever they trade back to in the first round is a defensive lineman, I would not put it past them to just say, we're going to do it and we're going to figure out the rest later. Well, and I, I agree with you there. I think the other part is, is the Draymond Jones contract in the mix of this. Whereas right now, yes, I would expect them to probably keep Draymond Jones. But to me, there's two different things that also possibly could happen here, Brendan, which is uh, a release of just saving some pure money, which would be about $5 million or trade. Um, or they could post June 1st, designate him and save a significant amount of money if they happen to land on a three tech that they think for the long term is going to be a better answer. After all, if you're not from John's perspective, counting on probably counting that, you know, keeping this guy past next year as his price goes up and the savings are large to move off of him, then maybe the, the thought process of taking a three tech isn't the worst of things, especially because there is a, there's a good many of them in this draft and they're of decent quality though. Like you said, is kind of the, you know, the, the body of it's nice, but the, you know, the, at the head, it's like, you know, it's just not there. Right. Um, also, I think it's important that we specify what we're talking about here. So we are talking about the defensive line in the sense of a 3-4 defense, right? Mm -hmm. We've got three down linemen in a 3-4 defense. Typically, there's always going to be a little bit of give and take there. You've got your nose tackle, and then you've got the two guys next to them, which are sometimes referred to as 4-I, right? Mm -hmm. And... Because of that, there's a clear distinction between defensive ends in a 3-4 and the ones you see in a 4-3. The 3-4 guys, they're going to be bigger. They're going to be stronger. They're going to be guys who need to occupy attention in the middle of the defense, whereas the defensive ends in a 4-3 tend to be a little smaller and more athletic because they're actually rushing off the edge. Right. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, we are going to be talking about the nose tackles, and 4-I defensive ends. So if you're wondering where your favorite player is, we're probably going to talk about him in a couple days. Okay. Yeah, not, not edge-based, edge all interior on this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our first guy here, this guy has become basically the consensus number one defensive lineman in this draft. Something that kind of felt like it happened late. It happened like almost after the season was over because there was one guy who was clearly number one and then this guy just took his spot. It's Byron Murphy, the second. No relation to the Byron Murphy of the Washington Huskies. Uh, 21 years old from Texas. Almost 300 pounds. 32 and 3 eighth arms. Had a real good combine. Blazing fast 40. Really good 10-yard split, especially for a guy on the interior. Big vert, big broad. But I'll tell you, the production at Texas wasn't exactly blowing me away. It was definitely a thing where you got to watch the tape to see the special player here. But uh, what do you make of Byron Murphy from Texas? I uh, I got to be honest off off the jump with Byron that he is not a guy to me that's been as uh, enticing as others have looked at him. I do have him as my number two defensive tackle. I, I do put a second round grade on him. Um, my comp form is Geno Atkins, but I didn't really – like the comp necessarily though i think it's there's some accuracy to it i suppose he is um he does have first step quickness quickness in general uh, ability to get skinny he's got a plan of attack with what he's doing coming off the line of scrimmage brendan and he's got a variety of moves he can use he's got one in particular which is this quick swim movie where you know the swim movie is usually one where it goes and then the arms got to come over the top and he can snap both arms off and do it right after the snap where it's just a real quick, almost like your eye blinks, and he gets himself free for that quick penetration, those quick pressures. You always like to see that from the defensive tackles that don't need to take necessarily a long time. He has that, and then he also has this, this sort of stutter step, pitter-patter thing that he can do in order post-snap to set the defensive tackle up, where if it's, he, if it's a pass set and he knows that guy's dropping into a pass set, he'll kind of slow down his rush, 
and just do a little bit of that stutter step like a running back would to try to get the offensive lineman to sort of lean one way or the other, and then he will operate off the lean once he gets him to bite. So he's got a little bit in his bag as far as advanced go. It It's a little bit of like you say, there's a lot of the pressures, but not really the ceiling or close to making the play on the running back, but the, the, the guy just gets kind of past him. And that's where we come back to maybe a little bit of his size stuff that he has going on in six feet tall, Brendan. We're a little bit not the longest that you like to see out there, the biggest you like to see out there at that position in this current modern age. It's not that he's like tremendously undersized where some guys we might talk about here, but just a little bit to where sometimes he can get all the way to the hoop, but just can't quite get it into the basket. And um, maybe that's something that rounds into shape as he turns into more of a pro out there on that, Brendan. But that was just enough for me to kind of go, I just didn't, as you said, the other two defensive tackles last year were more easier to me. Go, yeah, it's a first round talent. I have a harder time with this one going first round. Just feels like there's a little bit not quite there. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan either. I was actually going to say uh, you're going to have to sell me a little bit on this one, but it doesn't sound <laughs> like you're going to. No, not having it. <laughs> yeah, I mean... He's strong. I like his stack and shed game. I think he's a really good uh, hand user to stack and shed blockers. Uh, high effort player. He's got pass rush moves like you were talking about. He's not just a guy who bull rushes every play. But he does. he's short and his arms are kind of short too. He doesn't have those top end physical traits. I don't really think he'd be a great fit for a 3-4 because he's a gap shooter by nature. I think that's his best game to be a gap shooter, which is not really what you're looking for as a 3-4 guy. And again, I, I just don't really know why this guy suddenly became the most desirable thing in the world. I, I remember looking at him a little bit when the season started. He was being looked at as like a fourth round pick. I don't mm -hmm. know what happened. It's like uh, um, it just everybody decided, hey, uh, that Texas defense is playing really good. We got to elevate somebody. And Byron Murphy kind of got designated that guy. So well, I'm second round too. I think the analytics came into this a little bit too, because I think he's one, two with uh, Tavondre Sweat as far as the the top rated uh, defensive tackles in college football mm -hmm. last year, which probably oh, yeah. comes in a little bit. But, but I agree with you. I just think it's, I wouldn't maybe go to fourth round, but I, you know, I'd second round grade is what I'd mm -hmm. put on him where there's some upside. There is legitimate upside. And guys don't tend to come out of the draft this advanced with their usage of hands, nor their ability to come in with a plan of attack every single snap that they can differ up. That does make him very unique. But your point about the arms is that they measured in at 32 and 3 eight cents, but they feel smaller than that on tape at times. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want a little more wow factor if I'm going to put a first round pick on a guy. He doesn't have to be star potential to be first round, but a little more, there's a little more full sizzle there in that game that I can reach into. And there is some with him, but just not quite enough. But good player. It, it's it's a guy that certainly could be if he slides down the second round, right? And we fall back into the second round a guy that could be on the Hawks radar because of the fact that that could be a guy you go, look, we like him better than Dermont Jones. This gives us that opportunity and opening to, you know, move off Dermont, especially if it was one of those situations you'd move back in the first round to, to uh, pick up that extra second round pick. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he's a second round pick and I know there are a lot of Seahawks fans out there that really like this guy and would really love to get him in that first round. But I, I just don't feel it. I, I don't think he's a good fit for this defense, really. I think that he should be a three-tech in a 4-3 where he gets to shoot gaps, not a 4-I where he's worried about occupying blockers all the time. Yeah, it's there is some semi, you know, especially what they could they call that, you know, that uh, hat, gap and a half sort of stuff is what you're kind of, I think, doing here in this defense. And that's that, that's where it's going to call upon you not to just shoot gaps. There's a part of that where you got to get back to the backside gap and clean it up if God forbid you can't get to the ball carrier on the front side and you've got to regroup, you know, so to speak. Uh, so it's there. There is a lot in this guy's game to like for being a guy that I don't quite fully warm up to on it. The efforts there with him, you know, he's going to play really hard now. Part of that's this is why I think Texas has their DTs at the top of the analytics. Brendan is that there's a heavy amount of rotation uh, on that defensive line. Remember last year he had Moro Jomo, right? I believe uh, he was in the mix there on that inside at times. Um, so he's a fun player. I, I think that he would be a, a, an interesting fit if you're doing more of that. But like you said, I just don't think quite lands to what we're going to want him to do. And it's, it is weird because there are people out there that are trying to throw uh, a Justin Matabuke comp at him, which I can't quite get to myself. I've seen people try the Aaron Donald comp on him. I, oh my I, God. I, I, I don't Please get it. No. Jeez, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's such a disservice to Donald. Mm-hmm. Oh, he 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 kind of has uh, short arms. Aaron Donald had short arms. Okay, yeah. analysis over. Exactly. That's it. Settled. <laughs> it's as easy uh, as that. 
Okay, so yeah, for me, he is a second round guy. Don't really get it. Next guy, this is the guy who was number one basically all season. And then at the very finish line, Byron Murphy got elevated. But this guy's still generally considered a first round pick by pretty much everybody. Jerzon Newton of the Illinois Fighting Illini. Uh, 300 pounder. Got the same arm length as Murphy, by the way, uh, kind of interestingly enough. All the big boards put him in the first, like I said. But PFF is the only one left that has him in the first half of the first round. Wow. Very productive the last two years. Made, uh, what is it, 22 and a half tackles for loss, uh, 13 total sacks. And that 2022 Illinois defense was the best in the country. Now, last year's defense was awful, but they lost Witherspoon. They lost Sidney Brown. They lost... I want to say a couple other guys as well. I can't remember all Jar, the names. Jartavius Martin, the safety. Mm-hmm. He got taken yeah. really high in the draft. So definitely a more illustrious career than Byron Murphy. But um, what, what what do you think about him as a pro? Tough evaluation, Brendan. Uh, this guy watching tape, I've gone a little bit back and forth. with. I'm never not liking him as a player and, and what he would bring as far as he's obviously got some fun NFL skill set upside that he brings in, in certain respects. But just in where you finally fully kind of land on him as a player and where you think you should go and who and whatnot. I, I do think at the end of the day, I like him a little bit more than uh, Byron Murphy. I just I trust in a little bit of his more pure explosiveness that he brings to the position. Byron Murphy's got a lot of bag of moves. I think Zerzon Mutanun has a bag of moves that's a little bit less, but he's able to use them a little bit more with with a little bit more confidence to me that they'll translate fully onto the next level where you know some of I worry Byron's moves might get a little bit neutralized with that lack of arm like lack of size. Um He's got average get off, Brennan, but he, I think he's got top grade quickness and short spaces for a man his size. Uh, if he gets any separation from the lineman, he can close and flatten that path to the quarterback really quickly. And those three steps, those four steps to the quarterback feel quicker than you would normally get from any defensive lineman in the interior. It's kind of his one real to me plus skill that stands out. Um, he's got, uh, does a good job to me is also with his short area quickness of turning it into explosive power, be it whether it comes from the, to the tackle or if he's coming off the ball and the lineman's setting up and he's been able to really transition that into explosiveness. He can kind of put a, a tackle on skates a little bit with that. And you don't have much, they don't have much of an answer. You know, he just uh, kind of comes in that unique package. I think like that, that provides in that way that allows him to do that over and over again. And he's got really, really violent hands. I think Byron Murphy has really good hands. This guy's got a snapping violence to his hands and everything that he does that just to me, that's a lot more of that confidence that's going to go in and high end motor, Brendan, um, magnificent swim move. It, it comes in like a pinwheel and he's just chopping it down and it tends to get him released. And then he uses that short area quickness. Like that's the thing I, for me that goes back and forth with him as far as where I have the, the more of the confidence is that he snaps that down. He gets you, get off you, he gets off that block. And then he's always got that short area quickness to still then get to the ball carrier. Where like we talked with Byron Murphy, there's sometimes he can't then quite get to the ball carrier after he snapped off that, uh, that hand snap, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So Newton is my top defensive tackle in this draft as well. He is my number one. I think he's a first rounder, but not by a ton. I think he's a late first rounder. Um, I like his hands. He uses his hands really well. He's got the quickness and agility to win with speed and strength. I know he didn't test, but he's pretty quick out there. Um, he's also got enough strength to hold his ground against the run. Uh, some things that I wonder about him, it seems like he doesn't really get leverage yet. He doesn't sink his hips. Um, doesn't pop off at the snap the way that you'd like necessarily. Um, I also question the three, four fit. I don't know about him in four. I, I, I like it better than Murphy. I get it a little more than Murphy, but I still feel like this is probably meant to be a three, a four, three, three tech person. I think. I think he's definitely got the more of the ability to play at Brendan. I I think he could do my comp for him is Ed Oliver. And, mm-hmm. and I think Ed Oliver's done some similar things out there with the Buffalo defense that you'd be asking him to do here. I, I think he can do that stuff because of that strength and power you just talked about the ability to get back. That's the thing we talk about, you know, maybe with Murphy is like, can you just, okay, you've, you've shot that first gap. Now can you redirect, flip your hips, twist and torque over and get back released back to that other gap so that you can get in there to make that play or, you just have to run around it. You have to go around the front side of the hole there to get to that running back. And if he's already passed it, then is he gone? And I think sometimes Murphy's got to make that case of, I got to just try to see if I can get through the front side to catch up and trust my own little quickness to get there versus 
a guy like to me Newton, who's like, ah, I can just snap back with that windmill and pull back to their side. And I've got the power to throw this guy around just a little bit. He's not a, like ultimately some big brute in there from a power standpoint, but he's just got a little bit enough of that in there to be able to, to give it to you to maybe give me confidence. He could do that, which is why I've, I've got him just a little bit ahead of, of mm -hmm. uh, uh, Murphy though, a second round grade. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay. So we both like him. I like him a little bit more. Still not enamored. This is still not like, again, most drafts I feel like have a better defensive tackle prospect than Newton. I feel like he is, if you were to compare top defensive tackle prospects over the last 20 years, he'd be closer to the bottom of the list. I'll put it to you that way. I think two things and two things you mentioned in your assessment, um, the leverage you, you're six, two, you're, you're going up against six, four, six, five guys. Why are you getting that leverage loss so often? And I saw the same thing on tape. Uh, that's the one little thing to me that was, eh, that's, I don't like that. And then you mentioned the quickness. Yeah. He has the short area burst, right? It's hard to kind of always discern this a little bit like, but he, it is, like I said, average get off where it's like, okay, don't the first steps like kind of with everybody else. And then, woo, you know, then you get the little bit of the extra, the extra bit to it. And those are the two things we're worth with. we go, okay, that's enough for me to just kind of ding you down just a bit to the second round or, or late first. I will say in my mock, I ran was trying to look through all the teams where I thought these guys would go. I, I, I think need will probably overcome necessarily that second round valuation I might have on it. Cause I did in my mock have both defensive tackles going in the fruit at the late first round because of the needs of the teams that were there as much as anything. Yeah, that makes sense because most teams need that. And if that's the best you can do, then so be it. Yeah. What are you going to do at that point? I mean, it's, you, you got to grab what you can grab and, you know, team like the Rams, for instance, if maybe they can't jump on one of these quarterbacks, they're hoping falls in their lap. You could easily see them going over and saying, okay, let's get our Aaron Donald replacement in Newton or in Murphy. Not saying that they are those guys that, Hey, this is the, we got to deal with this, you know, and you, maybe they don't want to wait in this draft. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one more guy that I want to discuss in this group, although I don't know if he really belongs up here anymore with some of the recent occurrences. <laughs> Um, what you, you know, talking about, Brandon? Yeah, there are some things going on here that aren't so great. There are some things going on that we don't like. But as a player, there's still some interesting things going on with Tavondre Sweat. Now, before I get into this, this is a nose tackle. This is about the purest nose tackle I've seen in a while. <laughs> so understand that the first two guys would be playing that defensive end four eye roll. And this guy would very much be playing the zero tech role right in the middle. 366 pounds, <laughs> six foot four and a half, uh, 33 and a quarter arms, 10 inch hands. The combine scores were bad, but they're fine for a guy his size, honestly. Like I looked at the handful of players, and I do mean handful, like a very small handful of players this size that tested at the combine over the years. And mm -hmm. it's pretty much in line with them. Right, they can't move either. You yeah. couldn't move either if you were suddenly three hundred and sixty-six pounds. So I get it. Yeah, but uh, he, he was top one hundred everywhere. I don't know if he's top one hundred now. But uh, what, what do you think? Fun prospect, Brennan, for the reasons you kind of noted. So a very unique, a unique kind of guy, uh, Don Terrio Poe. Give me, give me a zero to ten on your scale of uh, how close you like that comp. You're muted. No, oh. Don Terry Poe. Hmm. That that's not bad. That's not bad because Don Terry Poe offered a little bit in the passing game as well, like this guy does. Like there is a little something that separates this guy from Mozzie Smith, right? There is a little bit of that added dimension that I think makes him a little more appetizing. That's what I was thinking with it. You got to find a comp and a nose tackle that did give you actually some three tech. You know, every there's some real lazy comps you can go do with guys that were just basically space eaters. But that's the thing that shows up with him on tape here, Brendan. And this is a massive, powerful man, first and foremost. He's also really wide. If he was going on an airplane, you know, some airplanes you got to buy two seats. You know, yeah. I think they might make him buy three seats. Mm. I'm just saying he's that wide. It's 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 a big dude. Uh, but the pass rush he gives you is the part to really highlight here, Brendan, because it is so unusual for within these nose tackles and what they give you. Uh, even when you tend to get in the past, it's on that, that the, the power, the, the bull rush guys that are just kind of slowly able to walk if they get a center and one-on-ones back off the, off the zero tech kind of positioning or something like that, or, or the quarterback just steps up into their arms. With this guy, there's actually some ability to create some separation in his pass rush and, and somewhat quick separation. He's got effortless power 
where, okay, he has 33 inch arms a little over his right, right that mark of where you'd like it to be. But he almost can just give you that power even when his arms are in tight like this. Like he can throw linemen around in like in this short space, even if he can't get his arms expended. So the power is, is really something that does show up along with a little bit of that sort of lateral quickness he can give you at that size. That's unusual for how big he is. I do wish Brendan had gotten down maybe another 20 pounds so we could make a little bit of a better evaluation of truly where his athleticism is because that's where they're going to want him to play at. And I think that's going to keep him, the fact he's struggling with this size stuff, probably in a position of playing about 30 to 35% of snaps a game in the NFL. So this is the question that comes back to you on this one. As I look at this in my evaluation is, you know, does let's, we'll talk about the situation that's just happened with him here in the, in the process. Let's first, you know, kind of just talk about him as a player here. If you're getting a guy that is only going to give you 35% of snaps in a game, can you take that in the third round? But knowing that that 35% snaps he's going to give you is going to be impactful is in, and in both ways, both in the run game and against the pass. Yeah, I would, I would definitely be willing to do that. I think it's kind of the nature of the position to rotate it pretty much no matter what. So if you're talking about a guy who gives you a very rare skill set but needs to be rotated a little bit more than the average, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. So I, mean, I got no problem that. doing it. I'm talking two oxygen tanks right next to the coach. Like coach might have to be every time he's coming off, you know, here we mm -hmm. go, big man. <laughs> yeah. And there are some concerns with his effort are some concerns with his passion and drive for the game. So he might just be cool being the novelty, right? He might just be okay. Being like, Hey, uh, everybody's going to know me because I'm the 370 pound dude. They're not going to know me because I'm a great player. I'm just, you know, good enough to stick around in this league. There is a little bit of that concern, I think. That's what is a lot of things. What uh, coaches and players will tell you will be the difference between guys and what makes them a pro successful or not. And in that everybody is talented. Uh, do you have the work ethic and, and care for your craft um, that you can, you can, you can refine that skill set and that you can become the guy you are capable of becoming. And I think you have a certain reference to why you're bringing this up. Right. So we had the DUI, uh, what was it, like three, four days ago. And then we also had a report from insiders in that Longhorn locker room that said he was basically a party animal. He uh, didn't really take anything all that seriously. Um, there there were some people in the Dallas area talking about this over the last couple of days. They said like, oh, he should be like a fourth rounder. He doesn't really take this game all that seriously. So there's a couple different things pulling us on this one, I think. It's crazy to hear it come out of the program like that, Brendan, because these programs keep things, so many things under wraps for the sake mm -hmm. of making sure that they don't show future prospects that this could maybe happen to you if we, you know, we're not going to protect you. So how bad must it have been that this leaks out in this way at this time? Right. So the the, the positives still apply. He's very powerful. When he anchors down, you're not moving him. He absorbs a ton of attention from blocking schemes. He's got a bull rush. Just generally speaking, he's got that nice pass rush. And before the controversy of the last week or so, I did have him in the second. I don't think I can do that now. I think there are some red flags here that have to start tugging him down a little bit. Yeah, the, the DWI is to me, Brendan, enough in itself, the timing of it, um, this is, you know, it, it's a litmus test for how much you care. You have to just simply toe the line for three more weeks and then you have guaranteed money and you're a multimillionaire. You know, that's all you must do. Can you do that? Do you have the control to do that? And if you don't have the control to do that, how can we trust you as a pro when we do start to pay you? And I, I don't like to tend to go into this psychological place with prospects, but this is something that says a very specific thing about where you're at mentally that this happens and occurs. And I agree with you. I think it's that in tandem with some of these reports, and Lord knows if any of these teams have these reports confirmed, and you bet your bottom dollar they will if they've got their people they've sent out to the facilities, this will indeed drop him down to the fourth round. If these things are in, it's, it, that's, that's, a, that's a double death now, you know, and he's no Jalen Carter. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and, and by the way, it affected Jalen Carter too. He was considered the best player in that draft and he ended up going ninth overall because of the stuff that happened. So it affected him. You got to believe it's going to affect this guy too. So I I'd still, I don't know. Third round seems okay to me still. I'm not. Boy, you start thinking about that. 
early fourth you got now because you flip back and you go, hmm. What, yeah. if he, what if he dips into that early fourth pick with the pick we move back on? Because that might be his landing zone at this point. We'll see what teams think. But, um, mm -hmm. um, you know. Yeah, so it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I still like his game. But at the same time, I'm also like, it's not like we're or hard up for a nose tackle right now. We have three of them. Yeah. I agree. I, this is one of those ones. That's why I say if it's that early fourth is where they, they strike. I don't think they necessarily would in the third at this point, but with the two fourth round picks that we do have, maybe that's, you know, enough for them to go, okay, he's just too good at this spot where he's falling to grab him. And that's good value at that point. Is it risk? Yeah, but it's fourth round. What's the risk in a fourth round at that point? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's kind of the uh, three guys that are getting the most attention, although Sweat getting attention in a negative way now, unfortunately. So feels like we bumped down a little bit to these next collection of guys, but they're still interesting, mm -hmm. still intriguing. This first one very much so because he has a little bit of a working background with Mike McDonald. We have Chris Jenkins of the Michigan Wolverines who played for the Wolverines when Mike McDonald was their defensive coordinator a couple years ago. 22, 6'3", 299 pounds, 34-inch arms, nice long arms. Uh, testing was mostly really good. Uh, really good 40, good 10-yard split, decent vert, monstrous broad for a 300-pounder. Uh, not very good change of direction skills on his 20-yard shuttle, but overall the testing was good. Pretty much all the big boards put him in the second or third round. The aggregate has him in the second right now. What what do you, what do you uh, make of Chris Jenkins? Well, on all these comps, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at every time on these. Give me a zero to ten uh, on my comp here, Brendan Cameron Hayward. Cameron Hayward, Steelers Ooh. defensive tackle. Okay, was Cameron wasn't Cameron Hayward a little bit bigger than this, or am I? Probably maybe a little like 10, 15 pounds, okay. um, but but in similar in the similar area of things, I believe he wasn't like a three twenty five guy, you know. So it, it's it's in the landing zone, so to speak. Um, but give me okay. your give, give me your uh, give me your uh, one to ten on that. Oh, I'm gonna give that like I I'll give that I'll give that like an eight. I'm not gonna go higher than that because I do okay. think that uh, Cameron Hayward was a little bit sturdier built, but. I think in terms of play style, you're you're kind of onto something here. Two ninety four, by the way, with Hayward coming out. Really, really, okay. For some reason, I thought he was way heavier than that. I know, I know. I, I, it, it was in there. But I, I think with what Cameron Hayward gave you with out the gate was a guy that was going to stop the run and could give you a little bit of pass rush. When it comes to this guy, he's given you a role, Brendan. That I mean, let's see if you buy into it. I don't know if you do. I, I don't know if I do, to be honest with you. I'm still trying to think of it as well. And then, and I know we're talk, we're talking three four end or or three tech. Uh, you've got to do kind of both within this defense a little bit. It's it's kind of a matter of semantics and what we're kind of calling them because it's you know, three down linemen, but then you have a stand up edge of the wide nine. But you know, one of your guys is in a three tech position uh, of those three down linemen. So he played all over that defensive line. But he is to me a you know basically a run stuffing interior defensive lineman where you very likely could find yourself with him at the floor of putting him out there as a run defender, but then not being able to really stick him out there much as a pass rusher, which is part of what put me down for him in the third round. Is I I like his skill set. He plays full tilt. He gets off blocks with aggressiveness. He really does a great job of tracking down ball carriers after he gets off of blocks. Many guys get loose, lost in space. He'd have a high awareness rating if he was in Madden when it comes to that. He just uh, doesn't have a lot of moves in his bag, a little bit of a rip move he can go to with some success, but he really just relies upon energy and effort and the high motor to kind of get him there as far as a pass rusher goes. And it works really good against the run because he's just a, the ball of knives kind of guy against the run to try to block with the hands coming at you and just got that power to him. But um, I, I worry he doesn't have as much of the upside you might want there as a pass rusher and that he has to end up making kind of his bones as just kind of a run, you know, run defender. I'll say too, you know, Michigan didn't necessarily do him a lot of the favors, moving him every which way but loose on that defensive line, you know, rather than just kind of giving him a home because there's times he's up on that edge, setting the hard edge, you know, where it's like, well, he's a should be more in, interior guy. He shouldn't be an edge out there in sort of a Red Bryant like role, you know. Well, it's not really his his thing. Yeah, you know what's interesting here? I've never seen anyone call him Chris Jenkins Jr., but there was a Chris Jenkins that is his father who mm -hmm. was, I think, the fourth overall. He was a very high pick in the draft for the Jets and went on to become a four-time Pro Bowler. He was a great player. 
Very good player. Very good player. Very different player in a lot of ways. He felt bigger than his son did. Mm -hmm. And and that's the weird thing is maybe it's just because of how compact the younger Chris Jenkins is. He just feels really compact and yeah. and uh and not as large as uh but his dad was just a monster. Yeah. Yeah, but but do you think he doesn't do the junior because he doesn't want to be in the shadow of his dad? Maybe he I mean, wants maybe to be his own man. Maybe but it's like when people are, are Googling, you know, it doesn't do much to differentiate you if you're Googling between you and your dad when it comes up, you know? So, I mean, that doesn't help, you know, from that. I don't know. I've never, yeah. I haven't seen this very often. Maybe they yeah, got a different it, middle name. Yeah. It's like when, um, it's like when Nicholas Cage, you know, he, he's, uh, related to Francis Ford Coppola, right? Mm -hmm. But he may changed his name to Nicholas Cage. So people wouldn't know because he wanted to be his own guy. Maybe it's like that. Right. I don't know. It's interesting. He doesn't want to be but, known as a Nepo baby. Exactly. So, um, high effort uses his long arms really well to stack and shed blockers. And I'll tell you the stacking and the shedding stuff. That's sometimes hard to come by. A lot of these guys, once a lineman gets locked onto them, it's really hard for them to detach. So these guys that know how to do it are great. He's all, he can also do a little bit of gap shooting, uses his hands. Well, now he doesn't have a lot that he can do as a pass rusher. He doesn't bring a lot to the table there. Um, I don't know if he'll be able to hold up against double teams. So I do question the fit a little bit, but at the same time, he played under Mike McDonald in 2021. So obviously there's some understanding of him being able to work on that defense. So I would be hesitant to take him in the second round, but I think I would be willing to do it, especially because I would assume that if we do take him in the second, it would be because Mike McDonald pounded the table for him because he knows that guy. Yeah, I think when it comes to Brendan, any of the players coming out of Michigan or Washington, if they happen to find themselves on this team, I, I'm not going to stew too much on them, no matter where they take them at, because of the fact that you have a unique insider knowledge with the guys that are pounding that table. It's not merely a coach falling in love with a guy. It's a coach falling in love with a guy who he coached. And and so there, there's got to be less of worry on that uh, from folks like ourselves when we look at those kind of picks. I do have him as a third round guy because I do think that floor is such a high likelihood. You just mentioned a lot of things that he does so very good in the running game. It's a multitude of things, including that sack and shed ability and the run stuffing ability is legit. Make no makes make no bones about it, but it is a passing leak at the end of the day. And I do think he ends up finding himself in that rotation where you're on passing downs, rotating somebody else who's just more of a, a lethal pass rusher than what he can supply. It can grow with time. He's not an old guy. Um, but that's also part of what I'm a little wor worried with me is, you know, he comes from his father. There should be a little bit more, maybe some of advancement in that than I was, I would be expecting for these kind of kids, typically in this, you know, background where, you know, they've had this, the, the father's connections to helping teach him up and get them there and all that. And he's a good player. No doubt he will help our defense, but I do think he leans into just kind of helping you in one area rather than really able to do much really as a pass rusher, because you just didn't show much of it on Michigan's tape. Yeah, um, six combined sacks over the last uh, two years for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry. I think I got that number wrong. Yeah, actually four and a half. I was looking at the wrong number, my bad. Hmm. So he did have decent overall production, but four and a half total sacks over two seasons. I mean, part of it is because he doesn't get to play in the fourth quarter ever because Michigan's winning by eight, eight touchdowns, but still. And they're bouncing in between that rotation of that line because he's not just lined up in that one spot that he's comfortable in. You know, we're going to talk about a couple of guys here that have you, they know right where they're going to be on every snap on that inside. So they, they get to operate from within, they get to set up moves, you know, snap in and snap out. He might be moved all along that, that defensive line for Michigan. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that's a pretty good rundown on Chris Jenkins. We both like him. Um, it's not as exciting as it once was. There was a point where we both really liked him. Mm. And then we dug in a little bit, and I think we found out oh, he's not really a pass rusher, and who knows if he'll ever be. That's that thing we come into, the final year of tape matters, Brendan, because you're you're speaking to the last year and the look at him when we initially kind of spotted him on the scene from the previous year's tape. And he showed you the previous year tape, the run defense was there, and then you were looking to see if the pass rush could take steps forward this year. And you could that that stuff would start to flash. The hand fighting, the becoming a little more of a technician at the position rather than just kind of a brute force guy with it. And it didn't come along. And so then that that does then kind of uh, middle down, you know, stop down a little bit of that up end that you thought was there, and, um, which unfortunately just it didn't show it. So you can't say it's necessarily going to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we were on one side of the big rivalry. So let's go to the other side of the big rivalry for this next one. Whoa, Neller. 
Mm -hmm. the the big game the big game and um i'll tell you chris jenkins is getting the better of this guy these last several years um let's talk about michael hall jr of the buckeyes only 21 didn't test but came in at 290 63 33 and a half inch arms 10 inch hands all the big boards have him in the top 100 except for pff the aggregate has him as a late second round pick coming in on the heels of a very disappointing statistical 2023 campaign. Mm. The guy did not build on 2022 at all. Mm. Nevertheless, mm. people still like him, understandably so, I think. But what's your read on Michael Hall Jr.? I, I've warmed up over a longer period of time a bit to him, though I'm I'm off the aggregate board on this, and I'm off everybody. The, I'm, I'm low fourth round. He'd be the first defensive tackle off the fourth round I would see taken. Uh, he's an active three tech who hunts and attacks. I think three tech would be the best position for him. I don't know if the 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 four eye stuff would be as much in his wheelhouse, but you know, again, it's can be some semantics on this a little bit. Um, strong swim move and a capable capability of getting skinny, you know, through really tiny cracks to get through. He's got above average first step quickness. I wouldn't call it like a a grade A skill or elite, but it's it's upper level for the position. Above average change of direction, high revved motor plus awareness. Um, he's going to fight in, through every play, even if the play is around him. He'll go find the ball carrier. So there's some things that you like about the effort and some of what you see from his ability to, to sort of hand fight initially. Um, he tries hard when it comes to run defense, Brendan, but it still feels like a slight weakness to me. I'd be interested to see your thoughts on this. Um, it's it's more than – it's not you know necessarily like horrible, but it's just – it's a little bit of you can go at him a bit, I think, at times. Um, he just feels small in these moments. You feel that he's at 290 pounds. You feel, mm -hmm. you know, there's a couple of these guys that we're going to talk about, frankly. I'm going to say this over and over because we've got a couple of guys that are at that sub 290 pounds, Brendan. And if you're 290 and you got a guy across from you at 325, 330, it, it, it sometimes just gets hard if you can't root in there and get that power locked in, right? Because they, they've got you. Um, yeah, he's a little lean. He's yeah. got kind of a lean-looking frame. And it does cause issues when he slides inside. And uh, he's not exactly a paragon of strength against physical blockers. I, I do think that his ability to hold up against double teams is impressive given his size, but it's still not that good. Um, I like how he can shed stack and shed blockers. I like that he has already legitimate pass rush moves. He's only 21. So him coming into the league with pass rush moves is impressive. So some stuff that I like. I didn't really like him during the season that much but i warmed up on him a little bit i i think that the third round would be okay but i don't think he's a fit here i think he's a three tech and a four three like you said i i kind of agree with that yeah i think too and i i wonder if on the pressures because watching the tape this year a little more it was seemed like he was you mentioned the double teams didn't seem like he was getting as many double teams last year they were treating him like you normally get a three tech where it's like okay left guard take care of business this year he was getting a little bit more of that help in there which i think did neuter a little bit of his production because even though he was he was at one and a half sacks from four i think he still upped his pressures to 22 off of mm -hmm. seven from the previous year he has got a little bit of that thing going on like byron murphy though brendan where he can you know can't can't quite you know million dollar move 10 cent finish you know where you just you can't quite get that final get the thing guy down to the ground you're just always this close to getting it there you know that that far away so to speak so i that's i dropped him into that top four because i did feel like we just didn't see that step forward as a player on that and i i do get worried about those guys that 290 if you're 290 you need to be bringing some really like kalijah cancy like level of quickness at that size in this day and age, you know, 300 pounds is kind of the going rate, you know, 305, you know, even mm -hmm. for the three techs, maybe it wasn't that way 20 years ago, but it is now. Yeah. A lot of the four I guys do seem like they're like 290, 285. Like I think Shelby Harris was about that. I think Draymond somewhere around there. So it depends on what kind of defense you're running, but you're right. Um, I did look at this in Baltimore. All of their defensive ends were plus 300. Yeah. So that seems to be the preference unless McDonald was just had it foisted on him and he doesn't really have that preference. I don't know. Oh, well, even if it was foisted on him, maybe, you know, hard to, hard to see him, you know, bailing off. But to your point on foisting, you know, well, let's look at the Rex Ryan background. Let's look at the Ryan defense as a background on this, you know, cause this is your, this is a bit of the model that this comes off of. Look at, look at uh, Wink Martindale with the Giants last year with having both Lawrence and the big cat inside. 
right? Those were his two starting defensive tackles in there. And mm -hmm. I would offer, if you look at Ryan's history with the Jets, you remember you know, Muhammad and Sheldon Richardson, and uh, they had one other guy down there, Brendan. Yeah. I don't know if you can remember. There, remember there was one other guy, Muhammad something, Wilkerson? Muhammad Wilkerson was down there at the same oh, time at that, right. that point. So they, they uh -huh. stacked. They stack the big dogs up in there. I, I think that there's a little bit more of a want here with this defense to be a bit bigger. If we're making the choice between this defense being faster or bigger, I think that there's a pull to be a little bit bigger up front mm -hmm. than, than faster. All right. So next up, we've got a combine superstar. This guy did wonders superstar. for his draft stock. This guy absolutely killed it, elevated himself to the second round in the aggregate, Braden Fisk, Braden Fisk of the <laughs> Seminoles, Florida State. Oh yes, oh yes, the Mike McMo the Mike Mamula. Yes, a couple of those going. There's always a few every year. If we're being real, somebody somebody's going to get people's attention. Uh, six four, two ninety two, thirty one inch arms, which that that's that's not going to be good for business. Mm. Um, but the combine score was was great. Lightning quick forty, good ten yard split. Vert and Broad were massive. The twenty yard shuttle was great. Was so much so, some of these big boards are now putting him in the first round. They kind of went a little crazy with it. Uh, pretty good production the last two years for Florida State. Uh, over 100 tackles, 21 for loss, six sacks. So good numbers, although it did seem like he was a little bit better in 2022 than 2023. Make of that what you will. But um, are, are people getting carried away with Braden Fisk? What do you think? They are getting carried away with Braden Fisk. Uh, I do put a third round grade on him. Um, he's a brawling, big, straight line, three tech with some get up and go. His uh, three step quickness comes into play, both disrupting off the snap and bouncing off blocks. Uh, he commits to the fight, Brendan. This guy is committed to the fight. You never have to say, you know, are you in brother? Are you in? He's like, I'm already here with the war paint. Because every single fight he's committed, and it's almost too much so, because he will lose track of the play because he is then in the middle of a bar fight. You know, he's in the middle of sipping the beer and he's he's trying to hammer the guy, and the running back goes right past his shoulder on it. Um, there's no doubt about his effort. You're not going to find a defensive tackle in this draft who supplies more effort. And that's saying something because we got some high motor guys, but it is really the high effort guy. If this guy went in the first round, you're getting one of the first high motor defensive tackles we've seen go that the movement of capabilities and all of that stuff is, is very true. No doubt about that. But the arms thing you mentioned, you want a defensive lineman around that 33 inches kind of as a minimum. And you certainly like beyond that. Uh, Cause there's a lot of these offensive linemen now we're watching. They're coming standard issue, 34, 35 inches, 31. So he's kind of a full two inches off where you'd like to be on this. And, and it's not just a matter of looking at the numbers on this one for Meyer Brennan's sake on this, because when you watch the tape and I'd be interested to see if you saw the same thing, the lack of arm length gets him in trouble. He gets swallowed up and it's, and he's, he's wanting to fight and he can't get in because the guys have him with their length, they're locking him out and he's just given up too much length in it. And then he just gets dr driven blocked out of the hole. And he has a lot of lost reps on the back of this happening where he can't really do anything about that at the pro level. Those 31 inches remain. The, the, the lack of being able to handle that, it, it, it remains. And he's not enough of a technician purely at the position to me to overcome it or have something that he you know, really does flash as far as on tape that matches to those testing numbers to where you're like, well, he's just so physically athletic that he'll, he'll be able to get around that. Uh, I, I don't know that he will. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of his NFL production is going to come on twists and stunts where he's unblocked which he's going to be really good at because he's so athletic. Mm. But Absolutely. I feel like it's going to be a lot of stuff where like he's completely unblocked going into the backfield. So yeah, th this one's tough. He, he he doesn't have shedding skills. Leverage is also a problem with him. He plays too high. Sometimes I think he's a little overly aggressive as well. Just kind of runs himself out of the play. And I, I, I don't think he's a fit for what we're trying to do here. We were just talking about how we like bigger guys. This guy's 292. This guy has baby arms. This guy plays with no leverage, so he looks even weaker than he actually is. So I think that somebody's going to take him in the second round, but I don't think it's going to be a team like ours. I don't think he's a fit here. I don't think he makes sense for what we're trying to build. 
Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, you're describing a skill set. It's kind of like maybe a Cowboys team with their defensive line and what what uh, I mean. We're going to maybe doing some of this now with with uh, Allen and that uh, you know in the house with our new DC. Maybe he'll be looking to do some of this. So maybe this opens the door for a guy like this because I think I agree. If you have him doing more stunt stuff and like that, that's more where he's going to be good because then you really get a feel for his. That's especially straight line explosion. I don't think he's as good laterally as he is going forward with that that some of that explosiveness and short area quickness, but. Um, yeah, he's he's getting raised up the boards, I think, higher than he should because of that that reason. And my comp for him, Brendan, was Derek Wolf. Derek Wolf. Oh, yeah, I remember Derek Wolf. He was a Bronco when they won the Super Bowl against the uh Panthers, right? That's right. <clears throat> yeah, I've seen him. All right. Um, so that's Braden Fisk, fun player, but ultimately probably just fun. I, I don't know if he'll ever be anything <laughs> exactly. great. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of, he's like the sugary snack where it's like, you're, you're going to get hungry in an hour, <laughs> but it's, mm-hmm. it was fun for a minute. All right. So this next guy's being listed as an edge player on some of the boards, but he's very clearly not going to be able to do that in the NFL, at least not full time. I'm not completely counting this guy out because he does have some impressive athleticism given how big he is. It's Brandon Dorless. Brandon Dorless of the Oregon Ducks, 23, 6, 3, 283 pounds. 33 and a quarter arms. I mean, his combine scores are good for a guy his size. A 4 8 5 40 is impressive for a guy who's 283. 1 6 8 10 yard split works too. Um, pretty good production the last couple of years. He batted down nine passes last year, which at that point it can't be a fluke, right? You're doing something right if you're batting down nine passes in one year. And we got a couple big boards that have him in the second, some have him in the fourth, but mostly he's a third round guy on the aggregate. How do you feel about Brandon Dorless? Ultimately, I uh, put Brandon in the fourth round, uh, Brandon, but not to say I didn't like some aspects of him. There are plays and moments that look very, very similar to me of Michael Bennett. And I think if you looked at Michael and this guy coming out, you'd see there's even some similarities between how that tweening place and his big thing with Michael, why he went undrafted, was he was just kind of in the tackle. And the difference, though, is that Michael showed an ability to play off the edge truly, Brendan. And this guy I don't think is going to be able to play on the edge. I think he's going to be an inside-only player at the next level. The 2022 tape, he played more on the outside, and I didn't think it was to his benefit. It wasn't good tape, and it, it wasn't necessarily to me something that said, this is where he's going to have a future. He needs to be moved inside more often. I felt like Oregon did move him inside a little bit more heartily this past year into that position, allowed him to just try to work in there. And, you know, he can create some quick pressure and stuff. And, and um, you know, he's, he's a light three tech. He's got violent hands with a dip. Um, so he really does a good job of when he brings down like his hands and kind of does like a chop move, he'll dip down after it really quick and he can kind of call upon it whenever he wants to, which I really liked about it. it you know, it's, it's kind of a signature, a little bit of his move he can go to. If he doesn't create the quick pressure, though, there's a lot of just losses across the tape with him and neutralization across the tape with him. And I don't think he's particularly really good against the run inside. Just a lot of sort of dead plays on his tape, Brendan, you know, where he's just, well, I'm stopped. I don't have a counter. They, they, he got me. He got me. And, and you just feel like there's not a lot of necessarily high motor running through those through those veins. You know, he doesn't have octane going through him. I will say that. But he does have a little bit of that. Michael Bennett, unusual moving that, that bit of that dip there's doesn't have Michael Bennett's first step quickness, doesn't have the ability to play on the edge, but there is some stuff with how he's able to use his shoulders and kind of, you know, square himself as he gets sort of sideways and peel himself through and kind of, I, I was it? I what the word I'm looking for here is kind of unusual way of, of getting there. He can do that stuff, but just not enough for me to think it, it's going to, another guy I just didn't think necessarily stepped really far forward this year. You know, some of these guys were saying that this, this guy felt that way. Yeah, I feel like he's going to be positionless. I mm-hmm. feel like he's just he's he's actually got some pass rush bend, like you were saying, which is weird, seen from a guy who's two eighty. Yeah, and his first step is better than it should be, given how big he is. But it's still not going to be enough. And I think he's physically weak. I don't think he has the strength to hold up in the middle either. So I think he's just going to end up like a man with no position. So I'm a little pessimistic about Mister Dorless here. Um, I had him in the fourth round because there is some stuff here to like, and you can try to figure it out. You know, he, um, he's got some nice moves that he can pull out. He's got good lateral agility for a guy who's 283, but overall, I, I just couldn't quite put him in the top 100. I put him in the fourth. 
And I, again, I don't know where he ends up. I don't think he's a good fit on either end of it personally. Yeah, it's, it's troublesome to try to find it. And I mean, how this is, again, it hit this hit with Michael Bennett hits with tweeners. Sometimes tweeners can go to just the perfect place to utilize them in the right way. Other times guys go undrafted because teams are just going, I don't have, I don't have the imagination to understand what we're going to do with you. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know what to do with you. And, you know, he, he's not quite to me as much as what Michael was. Maybe he'll prove to be a long term because those two other things Michael could really do to be able to play on the edge, play tough on the edge, get off blocks, still get to it. That first whip quickness really made Michael go because Michael would get into you so fast and then you were always putting the lineman in recovery mode. And this guy's got good quickness, but not that Michael had like a little bit of that almost lightning first step, especially as his career, career went on. Uh, where he just found that perfect weight to be really fast at that inside at that position. And uh, this guy doesn't just quite have that, Brendan. I went fourth round too because I said, well, okay, at least you can maybe rotate him in as a pass rusher along your line. But I, I looked at the snaps on this, heavily skewed at Oregon on the run to pass rush snaps to pass rushing. So they were trying to protect him. You can see by just the snap counts a little bit this past year and keeping him off the field in the run game. Could he be like a Draymond Jones? Because Draymond Jones is kind of an undersized guy that plays inside and slides outside on a, on occasion. I feel like Draymond was a little bit more advanced coming out of Ohio State with his hands and and his yeah. understanding of having a, a plan of attack. This guy's got kind of a a plan, but then there's sometimes where he just kind of comes off the ball and like I said, those kind of dead snaps where it's like nothing happened. You know, you didn't go to some move. And it got neutralized. You just kind of went out into the guy's shit you know, and you kind of went like this. And then you went, okay. And that's it. And the play kind of is dead for me. And I don't have anywhere. And you're just, he, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll kind of almost be brought to a standstill. And you're going, but, you know, give me some fight here. Get what's your counter? What's your, you know, there, I, I think with Draymond, there's a little bit more of the counters to the, or, or chaining the moves up. You know, one goes, the other was. He's got the one move. And then that's ch the chain stops. Yeah. Uh, Sid, Sid Jen, thank you for the $5. Always appreciate your guys's collabs. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sid Jen. Thank you, Sajin. Sajin. Sajin, Sajin, whichever. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but uh, thank you very much. We appreciate doing them. Yeah, man. We love doing this stuff. Every year we'll always kick these out, so. Oh, yes. As long as they allow us to keep doing this. As long as right. they don't kick us out. That's right. No more, co no more covering the draft, guys. It's a private mm -hmm. enterprise now. All right, uh, next guy here. This is a really kind of a tough one. Um, this guy was very hyped going into the season, like first round hyped, and then he just didn't really do anything. Leonard Taylor. Leonard Taylor the third of the Miami Hurricanes. <laughs> 22, six foot three and a half, 303 pounds, 33 and seven eighth arms. Testing was really disappointing. He was a very mediocre tester. 5 1 2 40, 1 7 6 10 yard split, just kind of like, bleh. and he had all of one sack and 19 tackles last year. I know he missed some games, but he didn't miss enough to justify that. So I don't really know what we got here with Leonard Taylor, but it was definitely a disappointing year for him. So where are you on Leonard Taylor? Oh man, from, from doorless to uh, <clears throat> Hall to uh, Taylor Brendan, I think my fourth round is the my island of uh, misfit toys. You know what I'm saying for defensive tackles, because <laughs> I'm cramming them in the fourth round with the rest of them. Uh, quick, penetrating, and disruptive defensive tackle who uses his arm length to uh, rope in tackles at a distance. Um, he's got great first step quickness. Um, not a leader close to, just useful in getting him uh, past long extension. Um, he can twist his hips and get skinny in the middle of hand fighting, which I think is unique for his size. Uh, most guys, they get the hand fighting and transitioning to flipping the hips. Doesn't happen quickly, and uh, linemen can tend to anticipate it, and so they can tend to adjust to it in advance, where he can kind of flip those hips, get off you, and it's not then really him using his hands to get off you. It's almost him using his feet to get off you. Um I think he's at his best single gapping and getting up the field. Brendan, if he's got a hunker down, it's more of a mixed bag. If he's two gapping, more of a mixed bag or doing like some of the stuff we'll ask him to do, mixed bag. Uh, just doesn't have the power at the point of attack to hold up. The effort in the fighter there, uh, he just can't find much success. Um, I think he's just missing some pure strength for the position, quite frankly. Um, good awareness in traffic post-snap. I think he can navigate the mess of a play, find the ball carrier, and still go make the play. <laughs> Um, he attacks a little wide with his hands for me, Brendan. Um, sometimes he can catch the underside of the lineman's wrists or into their arms and he can drive them up and he can walk the guy in the backfield. But more often than not, he's setting the stage where the lineman's driving their hands inside. I hug you out here on the outside. This isn't good for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
because now he's in, he's where he wants to be. He can control me and I'm not fighting him. I'm not controlling him back in his chest. Instead, I'm, I'm kind of like what lobstering him a little bit on the sides of his deal. And I can't do anything out here with this. And so it's like, he's trying to come up through and he's trying to strike and the strike ends up latching onto the shoulders and uh, some bad snaps in there where that just ends up occurring for me, where you go, this, this isn't not, that's a bad habit, Leonard. <laughs> I know what you're trying to do, but if the if the hands come up, you got to bring back the hands down under. You can't just let the hands go dead at that point and go, well, uh, okay, he's on my chest plate. Now, you know, you got to have something that you can do to bring inside at that point to get yourself off because then they've got him controlled. And then there's, then there's nowhere he's going at that point. So uh, another guy, like I say, in this fourth round, I don't mean to sound so down on these defensive linemen. It is what it is. But just a guy didn't come out this year and 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 put out his best tape in his final season of college football. And a guy that, like we've been looking on this list, you and I track these guys back to the start of the year when we started doing these shows. And so we've been looking at them going back to last year's tape. And it's just you didn't you're not seeing the advancement on some of these guys. You're seeing uh, this year's tape looks a lot like last year's tape. And that's a little that's a worrisome sign for mm -hmm. me with college football. You're not looking for huge leaps, but you are looking for that light bulb to go on and where that that progression will lie. So you can hope to see the progression at the pro level. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was really disappointed. He was a guy who I was really circling before the season started. Um, mm -hmm. He's a good gap shooter. I think he's pretty good at stacking and shedding blockers, uh, bull rush potential. I think he'll have a good bull rush in the NFL. Nice first step, but leverage loses leverage a lot. Not very good with his hands. Doesn't know how to use his hands yet. And I thought that maybe he would show up at the Combine and maybe do the Chop Robinson thing where he's like, oh, I didn't produce last year, but I'm still a freak athlete. But no, mm -hmm. we didn't get any of that. Not even close. Yeah. Maybe so fourth round, yard, maybe fifth. Ten-yard split in particular, man. One, seven, six, ten-yard split. I mean, you're looking for that. Him, He wants that first cup quickness. That's where he's going to make his bones if he's going to make his bones at the NFL level. And it wasn't there, to your point of that, at the Combine. No. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, fourth or fifth round for me, somewhere around there. Just going to kind of depend on how deep the draft ends up being when I put together my final big board. But yeah, disappointing. I landed in the fourth round as well. I had my, my, my pecking order in the fourth round goes Hall, Leonard Taylor, Brandon Dorless. Um, those are my three guys that I've got, you know, kind of stacked in there. And it's again on the back of that very talented guys. You're you have guys with upside you're getting in the fourth round. There's no doubt about that. These guys have something that there is on that that meat on that bone, but it's also not they, they they're missing enough to be elite in their area. And not I'm talking tier two or elite area where it's like, yeah, more into the to that tier that day, day three range of things, because I, I I'm not sure this is gonna round out and just fix itself. All right, so this next guy, this is actually a guy that I'm kind of into. I like him a little bit more than most people. I'm impressed. I'm optimistic about this one. And if we draft him, I'm going to have to learn how to pronounce his name, which is going to be a journey in and of itself. It is Rook Orhor Horo. Rook Orhor He's going to need a nickname if we draft him. We're going to have to immediately come up with a good nickname here. No, no way around it. Big ook. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, Clemson, 22 years old, 6'4", 294 pounds, 34-inch arms. Combine testing was really good all around. 4'8", 940, 167, 10-yard split. Remember, that 10-yard split for an interior defensive lineman is actually very good. Uh, Vert and Broad were both big as well. Big boards, we got a couple in the second, couple in the third, couple in the fourth. Um, not big production at Clemson the last couple years. That's the one thing that kind of gives you pause a little bit. He has nine sacks combined over the last two years. But, um, yeah, what do you think of Rook? I actually like Rook uh, a bit, uh, more than these recent guys we've actually talked about. I, I've put him in the third round. I, I know this is a comp everyone's looking to throw around, and we were talking about one guy that I didn't think was a fit for this comp. Uh, but here's a guy that I do think is a is a kind of fit a little bit for this comp and that he's a little inverse of what the guy did. And I think this this guy's more of your Justin Matabuke kind of guy uh, if you're looking at for kind of a direct relation. I think Matabuke coming out was a little bit more of a pass rusher who could do a little run defending. This guy's more of probably more of a run defending guy that can do a little bit of pass rush. But he's a solid all-around player. Um, disruptive three-tech three, three tech defensive tackle, excels at shooting the gap, first-step quickness, quick overall. Um, a killer of reach blocks, 
Uh, if you try to, with that quickness, Brendan, when he, the way he attacks, if he's getting upfield and you've got a lineman trying to hit the reach block to his shoulder, he's already up the field by the time you hit him with the reach block. And this is a blocking concept that's so heavily used in the NFL now. Having a guy that can kind of destroy that a little bit and get in the backfield and cause TFLs and just kind of disrupt the play overall is a very nice little skill on his part. Um, and uh, and he gets off the snap really smart with it too. He's quick with the snap count as well. I, I thought he quit, even though he's 6'4", 295, he does win the leverage war and gets delivers a really solid pop with his hands in the running game. I mean, he's going to root down. You're not going to move him off the ball, I felt like, in the running game. He's a, he's a solid three-tech slash defensive end in this draft, Brendan, and his ability to um, sit down and not be moved off of his spot and really battle in there. Um, I thought he will either get the quick pressure or he'll get neutralized to almost a standstill when it comes to a pass rusher. So there's very little in between. He brings almost no pass rush moves to his game or counters to his game. He is very raw. He needs to do a lot of working on that stuff. Uh, he's got the goods. He's 34-inch long arms. He's got the size. He's got, like you said, the testing numbers to do it. But he's definitely going to go, needs to go to class and take some advanced, you know, thermal dynamic rip swim move technique, you know, certificates uh, because he's he is lacking in that part. But um, other than just being able to you know run himself out of play at times, getting a little too over aggressive. Um, I thought his awareness was good and he's just overall, I think a pretty st uh, sound player, you know, um, I think he gives you a little bit of like Chris Jenkins, a bit of that floor of you're getting at least a run stuffing three tech four eye guy, you know, you're getting a guy that at least can give you that on early downs if you're taking him in the third round. Yeah. Yeah. I really like what Rook is bringing to the table here. I like the way he's built. Yeah. I like how he wins leverage despite being short. A lot of these guys don't, you usually don't come out of the college game with a good understanding of sinking your hips. I no. found over the years. Most of these guys don't do it. This guy does. He's got great movement skills. Looks very natural moving in space. I like the aggressive edge that he plays with. Now, like you said, double teams are going to whoop him. So he's going to have to add some strength here if he wants to hold up in the middle. Uh, he doesn't shed blockers as efficiently as you would like, although he's got the long arms. So I feel like he could get better at that, right? He's got 34 inch arms. There's some reason to believe he could improve. He doesn't really have much of a bull rush. I feel like he's going to take a year to get to where he's going. He's going to need a year of development, kind of like Derek Hall, right? Mm -hmm. Derek Hall just couldn't really do anything that first year. Now we hope he can do stuff this year. I think Rook is going to be a little bit like that. I think that he could end up being actually a pretty special player in this league. I would not mind doing the late second round with him personally. I can understand it. Um, there's some there's some middling or some worrisome defensive tackles we're even talked about here that are you know guys that are fairly highly rated. And uh, here's a guy that does give you some not only solid floor but also some, some tempting upside to him, which is why I wanted to go with the Justin Matabuke kind of comp to him because with Justin coming out and I think you and I even talked about it at that time, um, if not mistaken, with him just as a guy that okay there is some talent here, but it's. You know, I think he hadn't played the much the last final year of a season. You're leaning on pretty, you know, you're you're having to do a little bit of hope on that stuff coming together for him down long term and trust in those kind of ingredients. And I would agree with you. I like the ingredients there with him on it. I didn't trust enough in the pass rush upside to come to where if I landed even in a place of saying, I know you're going to be a solid run stuffing three tech or defensive end. You're solid in that point, that three, three, four defensive end. Well, that's good. I like that. But then if there's the the key questions as a pass rusher, it's not enough to quite bar, bump me up in the second round for me, but I completely understand doing so. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we got another dono here. Coda dad. Thank you for the $10 Canadian. I heard a Ravens reporter say that MM didn't adjust very well slash much in the second half of games after the midway point of the season last year. I haven't heard that anywhere else. You hear this before. Well, um, I mean, I think the Chiefs had like one first down in the entire second half of the, <laughs> no, that's the like, game. I, I, exactly. I mean, before we – before, and it's a great question, Cody, to add if it's being said because that's I always like to try to shoot out. But thank you, Brandon, um, because like first and foremost, before we get anywhere, before looking at their their season and not adjusting second half, they made one of the great adjustments of last season that we saw in that Chiefs game from what the Chiefs were doing in the first half. It wasn't by luck they started stopping them. They took away what the Chiefs were doing. And they still didn't then open up the door in the back end, right? So they they cut off the Chiefs' short passing attack, and then you would think, okay, you're you're squeezing up on that. Now you're going to get hammered on the back end. They still kept the back end clean throughout the course of that football game. That that's 
that's an adjustment. That's straight off of Mike McDonald running that, you know? So like, what the hell are we talking about? Um, on top of you had the triple crown defense last season. I mean, how many times would they, number one, really, I would offer, how many times were they really needing to make second half adjustments? Number one, number two, if your bottom line production is the triple crown of defense and your, your thing is, we, well, he did make second half adjustments. I'm like, okay, I'll take the triple crown defense. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, the thing that happened with the Mike McDonald's defense last year in the second half of the year that faded a little bit was the run defense. They had some leaky run defense in the second half of the year because, um, well, who knows why exactly? There are a lot of different reasons why a lot of different things you could dissect there. That was the thing that faded, not adjustments. I don't, I don't agree with that. I'm, I'm not really seeing anything to indicate that. I'm just thinking about the games they played too. Like they played the Niners in the second half of the year. I don't think they they didn't get blown off the field in the second half there. Well, it's like they, they got up and ahead of the Niners, and then the Niners, you know, maybe got it was a 33-19 game. The Niners came back in the game a little bit, but they were never within earshot. And part of that is a defense is if I have a lead, it's going to change some of how I coach because I don't want to give up the big shots. So I'm going to play it a little safer and maybe I'll let myself get bled to bled a little bit more quicker. Um, but that's how you want to, you manage the game in that way as a coach. I mean, you're not going to be like, we're just going to keep playing like we're playing and give up a big shot. And we're now, if I just play it straight up and make them earn it, they have no chance to win, but now I'm going to give them a chance to win. If I give up this big play, because I just want to play it, you know, what impacts what, I mean, if you go through their schedule, Brendan, I don't see to me walking down, like certainly didn't have a problem in the Seahawks game with the 37 to three game. I mean, the Cardinal game, they got back close to them at 31, 24. That's probably a little bit of them not playing up to the, you know, Cardinals, uh, Bengals 34, 20 chargers, 2010, uh, 37, 31 to the Rams, but uh, Rams are a tough offense to deal with, especially with Stafford when he was playing it sometimes near MVP level. We got that in the first week of the season, right? Jaguars 23, seven, that Niner game. No, they, they beat the doors out of the dolphins 56 to 19. So I, even the Steelers game at the last season, you have two Steelers game this year in one season where it was 17, 10, where it's completely on the offense's on the offense's shoulders as to why you're losing that game. Yeah. So from the information we have, I can't say I'm seeing where this one's coming from. That would be my assessment of it. If it does exist coded at it's, it's existing at that sample size level. They're taking it off of a, a two or three games off the schedule from you. Well, last year, you know, and again, that at Kansas city games, a key one that's almost worth like three games in itself because that's not you merely making a, a a good adjustment in the moment in the middle of a regular season game where not every eye of the nation is upon you. That's not you just making a, an adjustment against a ho-hum team. That's you making an adjustment and, and, and finding a counter to Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes who are two of the best in the business at being able to solve defenses in the league. Mm -hmm. All right, but uh, thank you, Cody Dad, for that. I, I actually had not heard this reporter thing. I hadn't either. That's wild. All right, uh, Holiest Hand Grenade, thank you for the member message on the Hawks Nest side for nine months. Brando, you going to fight for democracy tonight? I'm down, dude. I'm always mm -hmm. I'm always here for democracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I'm i going to be busy tonight, but I am playing Helldivers as well on my Twitch, and it's uh, pretty good. I like it. Yeah, it's fun, man. It's uh, it's a just a good game to get in with the, with the buddies and jump in, and you know, it's not anything super deep, but mm -hmm. it's good. I'll yeah, try to like uh, that whole jumping in and out thing. It's kind of like Left for Dead. Did you ever play that back in the day? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what it makes me think of. But I like it. It's good. Yeah, it's fun. It's unique right now. All right, our next guy here. This is a guy, another guy who we were really intrigued by before the year started, and then we got less and less intrigued as time went by. Just uh, kind of slipped away from him as the year went on. Mason Smith. Of LSU. Mason Smith. Mm -hmm. He needs a few more A's in that name, I think. Maybe that's what did him in. I don't know, but One not a very a. good year. <laughs> it can't hurt at this point. I'd start chopping that extra A off at this point. Uh -huh. uh, he's a big dude, 6'5", 306 pounds, 35-inch arms. Hello. That's pretty good. Mm. Um, the testing numbers were above average. But the production just wasn't there. He actually regressed a little bit from 2021. And then 2022, by the way, he didn't play because he got hurt, I think. I think he tore something. Yeah. So he was uh, 2021, he was playing edge. And then 2022, he was supposed to kick inside finally because that was going to be his best position. It's like the doorless situation. And then 
he had the injury in 2022 and then came back and played inside all year this year. Okay. So, uh, Mason Smith, um, how do you, where are you with him right now? This one's kind of tough to untangle, but how, how would you feel? I, I, I think for his size and, and what he brings to the table, he should be better on tape than what you see. Um, he's a very simple player to me. He just wants to, to lock you out, try to throw you away and find the ball carrier, you know? So it's a tackle shed dummy kind of thing that they're, he's trying to do every time. And, um, it, it can work at times, but it, when you always go to it constantly, then linemen know it's coming in. It loses its effectiveness. Um, he's able to play sometimes with some bounce off the block, get get a little bit to the edge of the arc when he's moving as far as for a big man. He's got a little bit of some natural kind of bounce that's unique to him and explosiveness that's unique to him. Um, but uh, most of the, what I was seeing from him was just getting washed out on the tape time and time again and, and an inability to use his length to the, to the where he should. I mean, he should be able to just get uh, really guys completely locked out and be able to kind of, again, I understand when he goes to that, that block shed tackle dummy thing, but there are other moves like a long arm bull rush that you can go do with those kind of arm length where there's nothing the lineman can do if you can just change it up a little bit. But he has nothing in his bag. Um, he did miss all of 2020, you know, too. So he's, you know, coming back and and he missed the whole season. Like he was down from without even playing a game in 2022. And that was with the new position change. So this is one that's another imagination one, Brendan, where you go, okay, well, the skill set's so good. He's so new to the position. He's going to grow with time. He will, he'll grow into his pants, you know, he'll eventually he'll grow into the shoes. You know, yeah, they're awkward right now. They look like clown shoes, but he'll, he'll eventually get those big feet into them. Um, but I, I don't see a lot in his game or bag. Uh, the the effort's just okay. There's a lot of snaps where I just thought he was just kind of just getting neutralized and there wasn't much being happening or going on. There's no counters. There's no plan of attack. Um, the effort level's just okay. Uh, I wanted him to be better, Brendan. And that's, if I had to put Mason Smith in a bubble on a, you know, I wanted him to be better for the last, you know, while here because that was a guy we were talking about. Maybe could be a top five kind of pick if he could really tap mm -hmm. into this physical potential. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm i tempted because I do think he'd be a good fit for this defense because he is a bigger guy. He holds up well against the run. He uh, can shoot gaps. His athletic profile is that of a potential star. But, um, you know, you have the injury risk because he's had injuries in his career. You have the um, lack of technique, the lack of being able to play with leverage. Like, like it just feels like he needs a lot more time here. I, I, I don't know. He might be years away. Like I said of Rook, that he might be a year away. This guy might be a few years away. Um, I'd probably be willing to shrug and take a shot on him in like the late fourth round, but that's about it. Yeah, I thought in the fourth round, in the late, like you say, late fourth round at that. Um, and I might even by draft day knock him into the fifth. Uh, you know, he's the 488th graded defensive lineman in college football last year to kind of put a little bit of a button on that one. And so I, I you look, the, the physical potential is there, and you can give him a little bit of like, it's not, is it an excuse or is it an explanation? Well, it's a little bit of an explanation when you have a whole season lost and then you're coming to a new position. You only played that position for one year. It's in the SEC. You're you're learning that new position, uh, you know, and at least in that full time role. So maybe a little more explainable as to why you didn't necessarily persevere as much. So I, with that, I'll give you a little bit of that higher pick. That's where I kind of oscillate between the fourth and fifth round, thinking on him is, well, maybe there is that part where you got to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here versus other prospects you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's Mason Smith, very uh, interesting one. But let's uh, let's stay on the same campus for this next one. Let's uh, okay. we we don't even need to move across the state. We're staying right here, and we're looking at Mekai Wingo. Mekai Wingo, also of LSU, also twenty one years old, very different player. Uh, six feet flat, two eighty four, so definitely undersized. Thirty two inch arms. The testing was really good. He's fast, quick, explosive kind of needs to be when you're this small. Um, not a huge production last year, uh, but overall he's had a pretty decent LSU career. So how are you feeling about Mekai? I actually like Wingo. I had with, with Smith, I've got him in the fourth round. With Wingo, I've got him into the third. Um, another one of these guys at sub 285. I know these, these defense tackles coming in kind of small-ish slash defensive ends. Maybe they're big defensive ends, I guess, is how I should be thinking of them. Um, strong, powerful, hard to move. Uh, Wingo, Wingo was a top level run defender for LSU in 2022, and he was pretty good again in 23, really dominant in 22. Um, he offers quickness that presents problems when he's one gapping. 
His uh, lower frame gives him e easy leverage win wars to me, Brendan, six foot, and he knows how to use that leverage inside. So with that power and then always, I mean, almost every snap at his size, he's winning that leverage war. There was a little bit at first where I wanted to almost give him some comps to kind of reminding me a bit of like a Brandon Mabane, where Mabane would be that same way where his just squatty, smaller size build would just allow him to get up underneath guys' pads every single snap. And there wasn't a whole hell of a lot offensive linemen could do about it. Part of what made Mabane so good as a player. Um, his production did go down at first look when you look at him this year, Brendan, but you got to look a little bit deeper because he sustained a major injury in October. And what I love about him is that he had that injury go down, robbed him of most of his season really, but then he fights the back after this, this tough injury to get back into the bowl game. And he goes out there and he balls out in the bowl game, puts up two sacks all over the football field, plays a whale of a game. Uh, that tells me a little bit about a kid's heart. You know what I mean? Cause that's a game where you don't necessarily have to come back in and play to decide whether you're going to the draft or not, and may not really raise you up or, or down one way or the other. And he shows, no, there's an opportunity for me to raise myself up. And there's many, I think NFL teams that are going to look at that situation and say, that's the, the, the kind of heart we want to kind of add to our team a little bit with that. I, I, something I like about him, just strong hand fighter. I think he plays stronger than his 290 pound frame aggressive. Mm. Um, it always finds a way it seems like eventually to get off his block and pass protection. If a quarterback's going to hold the ball, he's the kind of guy that eventually, okay, I didn't get on my win, early win, but I found a way on the second to get off and, and get to you. So um, I do like a lot of his game, man. Yeah. He's got nice speed and agility. He gets out of his stance quickly. I think uh, he uses his hands. Well, he even played a little bit on the edge, which I don't think he'll be able to do that at the NFL, but the fact that he's got that versatility to do that at all is you know, it's interesting, right? Like we see that with a lot of these players. When we get to the edge players, we're going to see this quite a bit where you have a guy who's like, oh, he played three tech. He played four. I, he played five tech. He played edge. He played stack linebacker. And it's like, well, not all that stuff will come over, but some, some of it probably will. Right. Yeah. And I think this is where the game's growing, Brendan, where you, you certainly are seeing this with uh, safety play and, and uh, perhaps maybe inside linebacker play when it comes to, like differences between a mic or a will and, uh, these, these positions are sort of all melding a little bit defensively, aren't they? Uh, into one along their positional groups, you know, where there's not as much the split there used to be in differences. There still is some, but it, it's maybe starting to close that gap. Mm -hmm. Um, being that he's so undersized, I'm not sure Mike McDonald would have a lot of interest knowing the kind of player he typically likes here, but in a vacuum, I think he is a third round pick. I think he's got that third round value for sure. I, I do think he is a third rounder, Brennan. Uh, let me see if you buy into this. I do think the key with him, and there is, I think, a key on this particular prospect, which is that you allow him to attack and get up the football field. I think if you're sitting him into a defense, to your point, and like even our defense with it, where there's a little bit more of the needing to kind of hunker down and, and do a little bit more gap and a half or two gapping at times, I, I think that's going to put him in trouble town. But if you just let him get up the field and attack, I think he can be a, a very, very uh, tough player within a defense and a problem for offenses to deal with at that point out of the third round, even in a rotational role, even as just a solid rotational piece. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could definitely see that. I think he could make up for his lack of size by being able to play with leverage as well because he's so short. I, I definitely could see that. But again, I just wonder if it's going to work here, you know, with uh, McDonald's pr predilection for the bigger guys. Yeah, I think it's going to be an uphill battle for him landing here. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is Mekai Wingo. Next guy I've got here is an uh, interesting one from Duke. They produced a couple of interesting defense, uh, def I'm sorry, football players in general this year. Dwayne Carter is one of them. 23 years old, 6'2", 302 pounds, 33-inch arms. Testing was actually really good outside of his change of direction stuff. Uh, big boards mostly put him in the third. Aggregate actually bumped him down to the uh, fourth. So I think the smaller big boards are dragging him down just a little bit. Not big production last year. That's probably part of the lack of enthusiasm on some people's parts. But 2022, five and a half sacks, 11 tackles for loss. So we do have something to lean on here. So what do you make of Dwayne Carter? I, um, I Boy, he looks a lot to me like a body style wise. He looks like a Jaron Reed. I, I think he's a Jaron Reed minus Reed's run stuffing ability, I guess, if I'm looking to kind of comp him out. And I'm talking about the Jaron Reed, um, Brendan, that's the three tech type of Jaron Reed. Um, yeah, this last year is a bit of a lackluster. And as you know, Brendan, where, where do I put my Island of Misfit toys of defensive linemen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they or, go. Or, it's or, like once you get past the top 100, it just feels different. It's like, yeah, I can just yeah. toss you here. 
It like does. the top 100 is too much of a commitment. It is, man. And there's just too many good ones out there in other positions where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he goes to my fourth round. He gets stuck in that group right along with the rest of the guys we've talked about there that had that really good year in 22 and then came back in 23. And it was like, Bleh. just didn't, didn't quite get there. When I watch him too, I, I think in the run game, he can get kind of eaten up on a little bit there. I don't think he's the stoutest at the, mo at the point of attack. And then as a pass rusher, it's really kind of a two trick deal that he leans on. He either goes to the power where he'll even set it up where he'll do it with like a bounce where he lets the lineman set up fully Brendan. And then he'll just bounce into his jump and then do the explosion. Like he, you know, like he's going into kind of a machine rather than a player. And he's, he set a few offensive linemen back with that maneuver, but he's got a good bull rush when he can get up under your pads and really drive with that explosiveness, um, which, which did definitely stand out to me. Um, his other thing that reminded me of Jaron Reed is, you know, Jaron does that thing, Brendan, where he comes off the snap and Jaron's not a guy that locks you out, but he kind of gets you in here and he, he does this move as he rounds the arc, you know, mm -hmm. he's just, he's like, it's, it's right. constantly trying to knock the hands off as he kind of is rotating around the edge off of it. So he, he either gets you loading up to his power where you think the power is coming, but then he, he hits you with the little, the little this, or it's, it's that or one or the other. It's really not anything else. He doesn't have like a, a spin move or much of a rip move or swim move. He really goes to, it's just kind of those two things that he calls upon. And then you have him as kind of a negative in the run game. And then the lackluster year this past year. So uh, he has some good traits to him. He's not a bad player at all. And he might still have some upside that's unforeseen. He's a three time team captain too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is going to be a guy you want all about ball. Who's going to come in and work his butt off. He's going to give you that. But again, you know, just uh, this defensive line class could have been so much better with some of these guys coming back through and taking that step up this final year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I like him. I like his bull rush. I like his stack and shed game. I like the fact that he understands leverage. Um, but he's going to have to add more to his pass rush arsenal. He's going to have to add some moves here. He's not explosive at the snap. He's also a bad tackler. He he had like a big pile of missed tackles these last two years. Mm -hmm. Um, so he might be a decent fit. I would say late third. Hopefully, you can wait for the fourth round though. I'm a little more fourth round with him, but I like him a little bit more than the guys I put in the fourth round. I'll say that. Yeah, I'm gonna probably waffle on where I put those fourth round guys. That's gonna be my my island. You know, again, talented guys, but just day three, and he's in that mix with the rest of them. And I don't know. I, I I've got him right now, right in there, door ahead of doorless, just behind doorless, probably top of the fourth round. I will give him that. But it, it's just a guy that I do think you got to slide in the fourth round with this last year. You got to lean on that last year of production. And if it's not an injury explanation like you might have with a guy like Wingo, or not Wingo, but um, yeah, maybe it was Wingo that I'm thinking of. Um, then you, you got to go, okay, there's, he's just not taking that step forward that we we're hoping to see, especially if it's a half step back. Okay, next up, we have another guy who took a big step back in 2023 after flashing onto the scene in 2022. We have Tyler Davis of Clemson. Tyler Davis, um, 6'2", 301 pounds, 31 and 3 eighth inch arms. Testing was mixed, I'll say kind of all over the place, had a five second, 20 yard shuttle. So maybe he fell down. I don't know. I didn't see it, but it was bad. <laughs> that's, that's rough. <laughs> five, five flats rough. Yeah. It looks funny when you write it down too. You're like, wait, I can't five. <laughs> is, is he like a center? Is he like a right guard? Is he uh was he three fifty? Did he do the, is he, did he do the Tavondre sweat three fifty thing? Is that, <laughs> no, 300. Yeah. Yeah, they should have let him do it again. That's just mean, you know? Yeah, he should have done the Romo thing, man. He should have been out there till the end of the combine trying to keep redoing it until he got the, you know, like mm -hmm. he did with the, the uh, shuttle. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Walter Football really likes him. They have him 80th. They have him in the third round, but everyone else has put him in around like the fifth now. Uh, last year had three and a half tackles for loss and half a sack. Half a sack after a year where he had nine and a half tackles for loss and five and a half sacks. So he took a couple steps back, but still an intriguing player still on my radar. What, what do you make of Tyler Davis? Yeah. He's a flexible defensive lineman. I think too, where you can give him a little bit of nose tackle three tech with him, Brendan. I, I think he does give you a bit. He's not, I wouldn't put him full time nose tackle, but it, you know, you can flick fl flip him in there every once in a while. He's shown some of that in his skill set. Um, I think he's front and scheme fluid a little bit, which is going to help him out and where he does get drafted. Um, he has an unusual ability to slide laterally faster 
than the man blocking him post snap, which is part of what helps him get laterally. Certainly helps him on those those stunts. You look at another guy that might be taken by like the Cowboys for with all the stunting they do, uh, or Washington, I should say. Now with Dan Quinn, um, this would be that kind of guy. Um, he can get upfield um, really fast. I think I wouldn't call him pure quickness, but relatively fast for his size. He's got a really nice rip move. That's his padded move to me, Brendan. Just that rip comes in and uh, helps him helps him get free. Um, when he gets the old lineman on the edge, um, sorry, I was trying to find my notes on this. It's not showing me there. Um, so he's got a little bit of hand usage, a windmill over the top move. He does to kind of clear himself. He does got a lot. He goes to, um, an initial bull rush where he can kind of bounce laterally off of it if he doesn't get a win with it. So that there's some creativity to some of the things he does. That's a little bit more unique than your average defensive lineman. But with that said, it's, it, it wasn't the greatest of seasons here where you're expecting him to take that step forward. Um, he doesn't have any kind of counters if he can't get the initial move to go. He's got a little bit of some tweenerness to him. He's not a full on tweener, but that, to me, there's that little bit of tweener because I don't know if he's really fully on can be a three tech or fully on be the one tech. I uh, I did kind of slide him again back in that fourth round because, like you said, it was accurate that this is a guy you're looking for that step forward this year. This guy last year's tape you watch went okay. There's some exciting elements here. Excel elements I expect to see on a sophomore. Now junior, nail it in. All right. Put put your put your sign in the ground and say, hey, here, I'm I'm gonna go be a first, second round guy. And you come back and you kind of put up about the same tape or a little bit behind the tape from the previous year. There's some wonder for me of why that occurs. You know, if there's no injuries that you can kind of call upon or they didn't start using you differently in the scheme somehow from the year from the prior year to the next year, which they haven't here, in my opinion. Um, so I, he's a tough eval to me, Brendan, a little bit for those reasons. Yeah, I like his ability to hold up against the run. Like you said, the nose tackle stuff. He can play a little bit of nose tackle. I like that he can hold up against double teams. I like his lower body strength. So there is some stuff to appreciate here, but at the same time, this is a passing league. He doesn't really have pass rush moves yet. He doesn't have the hands to maneuver through pass blockers. Leverage is a little bit of a struggle for him. So I, I put him in the fourth round. I think there's enough here to put him in the fourth round. Yeah, I all these guys I wanted to like more with it from us looking last year, and I just remember us looking at him. But and I even I turned back on the tape with him today because I was looking at both him and Rook, and uh, Rook at least kind of was like, okay, yeah, I remember now. Here, well, I, I like looking my notes on Rook. I was like, okay, and I, I came back and just started adding more new notes on Tyler for what I was looking at. I just they weren't great notes. There was some bad for every good. There was a bad note I was putting on there, and I went, man, yeah, yeah, too yeah. many bads. Yeah, all right. Um, next up, we have another kind of nose tackle type, although I'm not 100% sure that's what he'll do in the NFL. McKinley Jackson. McKinley Jackson of Texas A&M, the Aggies. Uh, 326 on a six foot one and a half frame. So he's a little bit thicker than most of these guys. 33 and seven eighth arms. Uh, combine testing was really poor, which makes sense if he's going to be a nose tackle. Um, decent production the last couple years. How do you feel about McKinley Jackson maybe taking that nose tackle role? Unusual nose tackle in uh, the six one and a half size in this day and age. Uh, but he did came in with almost 34 inch long arms, which you can feel on tape with the 326 legit weight that he brings to where he's able to overcome that six and a one and a half. And it can not be a detriment to him. He can use that to his advantage. I would like to see him use the leverage stuff a little bit more. He gets a little bit more higher up and just trying to lock those arms up and it raises him up a little bit too much. He needs to play a little bit lower, but he's a stout, strong nose tackle, capable of bringing impact, I think, in both the run and the pass, though he is more of a run defender. Um, he's He's got a little bit of extra proportion in his chest and width in his chest, and he, he really has got – you can feel his strength and power when he locks up with uh, – centers and guards and even double teams where I think he holds up relatively well. I have him as my number two for whatever it's worth, Brendan, nose tackle in this draft, though it's not exactly a, a you know stacked group, right? So it's you, you kind of win by being the default last couple guys in the room. <laughs> it's like, well, there's yeah, uh, you is you know kind of where yeah. is that? I don't know if there's another legit nose tackle in the draft after McKinley Jackson, honestly. I don't know if there is either. Certainly not one that I would trust on NFL Sundays to go out there and play and be eating up a lot of snaps and trying to be good, just even stopping yeah. the run. It's yeah, the other guys might all be UDFAs, and I won't be that shocked. Yeah, I wouldn't in the least as as well. That's my outlook on it as well. So I, I thought that um, he looks a little unusual in size and Bill Brennan for what you see from nose tackles when you first turn on the tape, but he gets the job done for what you want from a nose tackle. Is he maybe missing some of the size they're going to look for there? Well, maybe, but let's also remember, 
They had Michael Pierce down there last year. How big is Michael Pierce? Six foot, six one. So there is an opening here for McKinley Jackson to arrive here. And it is in consideration of the fact that he is to me, the second nose tackle on the board. In fact, probably might even go as the number one nose tackle right now, depending on what happens with Tavondre sweat situation and, and that right. dip and drop. So uh, I saw him as a, a slightly shrunken version of Dalvin Tomlinson, uh, not a guy that's going to go out there and make any magnificent impact, but will be a solid player in your defense and stop in the run. To me, that was worth a, uh, a third round pick. Yeah, I went like fourth rounder on him. I wasn't that impressed with the way he occupied blockers. I don't even really feel like he he might end up being like a a one tech more than a zero tech. I feel like I don't know if he'll be able to do the things that a true nose tackle needs to do. He gets stuck on blockers. Uh, I feel like he's meant to play in an even front at the end of the day. He needs that little extra help of having a three tech next to him opposed to a nose tackle that just has his two four eye guys next to him. Uh, I like that he uses his short height to win leverage. He's always the low man because he's so short. Um, he launches into contact off the snap quickly. His first step is nice, but I don't know. He didn't quite suck in defense um, blocking attention the way I like. Understandable. Yeah. Well, it's it's there's definitely something with him where I'd go late third, but I would go late third because I think he's going to come in and at least give you a good run stuffing defensive tackle down in there and uh, hard to find, hard to find this draft. Mm -hmm. All right, um, next guy, we're going back to the defensive uh, tackle types, the defensive ends. Gabe Hall is the next guy we're going to take a look at here. We are definitely getting down, I think, into like a different area of the draft. Before it was like, you know, fourth rounders, a little bit of third rounders. Now I feel like we're getting down into where these guys might consider themselves lucky just to be drafted, where we're starting to approach that zone Baylor Bears. I think there's a thing with Baylor Bears defensive linemen and not being any good in the NFL. You see, you remember, and you remember, I've got a, I've got a prejudicial nature towards Baylor defensive linemen. Mm -hmm. We've talked about every year. We talk about this, Brennan. <laughs> I just yeah, they don't do produce it. one every year. I don't do it. I don't do them. I don't do them. Uh -huh. Can't do it. Can't yeah. can't win with them. Yeah, can't win with them, Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting body type. Six six two ninety one. So that's like uh, Shelby Harris type stuff. Mm -hmm. 34 yeah. and a half inch arms testing was good. He had a monstrous broad jump uh, production last year was disappointing. He did not build on 2022. I think he got hurt and missed a couple games, but not enough to justify his complete drop off. So yeah, Gabe Hall, what, what do we think? I think he's a finesse tweener defensive tackle, not quite quick enough to be a three tech, not quite strong enough to hold down at the one tech. Um, he does have some side to side bounce, which can help him a little bit as a pass rusher, but it's hit or miss. And when he gets neutralized, it's over with, he'll get completely ground to a halt. Uh, I like his pursuit and effort, but he has very limited athletic gifts. In my opinion, he has uh, developed a kind of a nice uh, push pull swim move. So, you know, he push, pushes the guy up, makes the guy think he's locking out with contact then pulls him down and then comes over the top with a swim move. And he can kind of go to that nicely. He also showed that off of the Senior Bowl a couple of times throughout the week there at the Senior Bowl, which was, um, which yeah, I, I found interesting because there was sometimes that's he doesn't have a lot on tape. So what he did show on tape when that did come up, it did work. It just that's all he could kind of go to at times. I don't think he uses his arm length at all enough to his benefit, Brendan. If you're that long, you've got to use, especially at six six, because you're not winning leverage a lot of the time. Um, I also felt like all the he half the time he always seemed to step slow off the line of scrimmage just where he was not coming out of his stance fast. I know he's 6'6", six, six, but there's guys we'll talk about in this draft that are at that size that they're able to at least get off the blocks and, and not feel like they're hit hitting the slow motion button, um, which I thought showed up a lot. I, I just think he's kind of a tweener, late day three pick. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I think he'll kind of join the assembly of a lot of defensive linemen out of Baylor, just, you know, physically very marvelous you know go look at sean, like sean oakland remember that sean oakman one? Oh yeah back in the day i mean they're they always all come out just monstrous and huge and arms 40 inches long and 10 feet tall and knocking cities over with one arm and just can't play on the football field yeah it's it's kind of too bad i think he'd be a great fit in a 3-4 defense in that four eye roll i think i like the pop he hits with coming off the snap i like that he gets he, he sinks his hips, which he's going to have to. He's really going to have to get low. Mm -hmm. And he understands it pretty well. He uses his hands well, but he's going to get pushed around in run defense. Not very strong. I, I mean, after watching him struggle so much at Baylor in 2023, I 
ended up putting him around the fifth or sixth round. Wasn't terribly excited with this one. So I'm there. Yeah. I just, there's just nothing, nothing really exciting in what you saw from him. In my opinion, I just, I, you know, to mm-hmm. just be yeah, a guy look behind the measurables and go, okay, what you got? And there's a couple of guys in this draft that got some remarkable measurables. I'm a little bit like this oh, yeah. with miles Cole too, at uh, Texas tech. It's like measurables are insane, but the play on the field is not quite there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so next guy is going to be the resident Alabama defensive lineman this year. They're they're not sending their best. Uh, They've they've definitely done better than this in recent years. Justin Iboigby. Justin Iboigby of the Crimson Tide, 23, 6'4", 297, 33 and 3 eighth arms. Testing was pretty bad. But I'll tell you, the big boards are kind of eating him up. We've got a couple that put him up in the third and the, on the aggregate, he's currently like a fourth-round pick. Good production last year. Seven sacks as an interior defensive lineman's no joke. But uh, what do you think about Ibugby as a player? He's also a tweener, but this is the fun type of tweener um, in a 4-3 defense. But maybe an ability to rock the defensive end in a 3-4. I'm not quite sure on that, to be honest with you, Brendan. Alabama put him all over the line of scrimmage. One tech, three tech, five tech. You know, he So he wasn't just in the interior. They did have him out there at the edge at times a lot of twisting and then stunting right so starts out the defensive end twist back in through the a gap a a, a lot of that a powerfully built guy just well proportioned well built you know look doesn't look like there's any bad you know he's all kind of all muscle kind of look to him strong as hell smart in his ability to read and react and play really well in space Part of why I think they were so comfortable in moving him all over that defensive line. You saw this with Chris Jenkins a little bit too. It's it's that awareness and understanding of what they're seeing in front of them from where they're being aligned at and being able to react to it really fast and quickly. Um, I think he's impossible to move off a spot when he's aligned as a defensive end in the run game. So if, if there is a little bit, if you look at the potential of turning him into a bit of a power edge over there, he didn't test well enough to think that's going to be able to do that at 5'1", 840 and a 1'8", um, 10-yard split. But I I... I in college, when they put him over there, you weren't running at him. You weren't getting anything done if you did put him out there. Um, his get off is marginal, Brendan, um, when aligned as an edge, but it is a plus on the inside. Um, when rushing from the outside, he leans all the way to on power to push the tackle back and onto the outside um, pocket, outside shoulder of the tackle, and then kind of wants to then beeline inside. So get you on the uh, get you on that off foot and then beeline in. So again, when he's he had so many snaps on the edge, so I I just had to get that in there. If they do look at him as maybe having some of that ability. Um, he transitions inside to kind of a quick penetrator, first step quickness. It's not elite, but it's good. It's there. Five step burst. Good. It's there. Um, all these would be plus skills. I would never give him like even a, you know, well, this is like top five in the class or anything. Just plus, um, not really any pass throughs, not really any pass throughs, Brendan, just kind of looking to stack and shed and shake the defender back and forth to find an opening to attack. Um, only one year of plus pass rush production there too. This is a one year off. I believe he's had some injury issues. He's had to fight through, I think a little bit at times. So uh, a fun player. Um, does he have some usefulness on the edge? Is he better as a four, three kind of guy than a three, four? These are the questions that I ask in where I stand with him. And I kind of came down to the answer of it, Brendan being that I, I do think he's probably better in those kind of places. I just said, mm-hmm. with that said, I do see him as kind of a fifth round guy. Um, who's got a fun skill set for what he brings. Yeah, that's where I had him too. I do like his bull rush. I think his bull rush is pretty legitimate. Uh, good, solid tackle fundamentals. Doesn't miss a lot of tackles. I like his frame. He looks like an NFL defensive lineman. Mm-hmm. But he just isn't that good of an athlete. He's not strong enough to hold up at the point of attack. Not a lot of closing speed, I feel like. So I feel like he's one of those high effort players who overcomes a lack of physical gifts which, I mean, that has a place in the world, but I went fifth round. I feel like he's getting a little bit overhyped because he played at Alabama. Like, all these big boards putting him in the third round is like, would you be doing that if he did this exact same stuff at, you know, Coastal Carolina? And I yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, too, if you look at the recent track record with Alabama, uh, yeah, you got your Jonathan Allens and what, we got Quinton Williams and yeah, like Ron Paynes. But what, where have we been at recent years here with the defensive lineman coming out of Alabama? You know, who was the guy last year? Uh, oh. we, had Fid- we had Fidarius Mathis a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you had the the guy that went to the Dolphins, Ray, Raekwon, Raekwon something or rather, who's been okay as a football player out there for them. 
I, I mean, my point being is just that it just feels like in recent years, the linemen coming out of Alabama haven't been as good as they were maybe six, seven years ago, where it was like, oh, yeah, Alabama linemen. You know, it's more like he's got some tools. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. And I think that it, I, Alabama is sending quite a few edge rushers that I like in this uh, class, not mm-hmm. just Dallas Turner, by the way. And we'll talk about that on Saturday. But uh, the interior guys, not not great this year. Yeah. I mean, even maybe with this guy, the best thing I like with him is maybe when he is on the edge in, in Alabama mm-hmm. might on tape I watched. Okay. Uh, we got another Illinois guy. This is uh, Jerzon Newton's buddy here, Keith Randolph Jr., 23 years old, six foot three and a half, 296 pounds, 32 and three fourths inch hands. Testing was pretty lackluster. Uh, most of the big boards put him around the sixth or even seventh round at this point. Had nice production in 2022, and then 2023 fell off a cliff. So what are you making of Keith Randolph Jr.? He'd be a, a bigger 3-4 defensive end you normally see, um, but I think he can be kicked inside a three-tech. Um, he seamlessly played pretty well between two-gapping or one-gapping, uh, which I did like, where a lot of these guys in this draft just tend to lean towards one or the other in the, in the defensive line. Got a nice swim move. He uses with first step quickness to get free into the backfield at times. Uh, it, it was a flash more than I would say it was a consistent thing you saw. High motor. I think many of his acts just came from fighting and keeping his heads up and being active. Quarterback climbs the pocket. He's there with a waiting arm, snatches him up. These kind of plays. Um, he had an okay year um, and then a real strong year the year before that. So another guy that didn't maybe have his best season. Now, you know, Brendan, like you talked about with uh, Dino Newton, is that part because you lost so many of those great players on that Illinois defense mm-hmm. for the prior year. And it's like, well, you're, you're kind of rebuilding this year. Everybody's kind of having to get by at this point. I think there's a good point to be made within that on that, uh, quite frankly. Um, so I think he's got a solid all around game without anything that's got some sizzle to it. I, I don't think you go, well, he's just great at run. Well, he's great in the style and against the pass. He's, he's, he's got some okay flavor on both elements of things without even anyone being his, his true strength, I would say. But with that said, I don't know if there's a high top into either which does put me for him into that more fifth round area with, with Justin, the kid we just talked about. Yeah. I ended up throwing him into the sixth round. It's kind of an interesting combo here. Like the main thing about him is that he's a pretty good gap shooter. He was really good shooting gaps in 2022, but he's not quick off the snap. So you wonder if those opportunities are going to get swallowed up in the NFL level overall, not offering very much as a pass rusher. I like that he understands leverage. I like that he was a team captain for Illinois but he he's not a good block shedder, not a good athlete. So he belongs in the league, but not by much. I think he'll be okay in an early down run defending role, but I'm not looking at him really until the sixth round. That's fair enough of evaluation on him. I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't argue with that one. Uh, okay, next guy that I have listed here is uh, Marcus Harris of Auburn. Marcus Harris, uh, 6'2", 286, 32-inch arms. Testing was a little below average, unremarkable. Um, Big boards all over the place. CBS likes him a lot. They put him in the fourth. PFF puts him in the sixth, and the database puts him in the seventh. Productive last year for Auburn, seven sacks, 11 tackles for loss, but um, not doing him big favors yet in terms of, like, draft stuff, so... What, what are you thinking about Marcus Harris? I had a hard time with this evaluation too, Brendan, where I just didn't like him a lot at first. Then he warmed up on me with a little bit of his play. A top heavy three tech. He's played a ton of college football, but just only really blossomed this last year. Um, he really came forward as a run defender with the, with those seven sacks in addition to it. So it's on both sides of his game. Um, he mainly does it with strength and effort. And I would call just a smidge of quickness. He's that guy that has some first step quickness, but then it, it really slows down really fast. And you start to feel him lumbering anywhere in space when he has to move five, six steps. It's just, it is in the testing numbers with the one, seven, seven, 10 yard split show this out where it's, if you looked at him like that 10 yard split and you looked at the first, probably three yards, you'd be like, Ooh, but it's, it's gone or even the first yard, I guess it, but then it just goes so quickly after that. Um, now, this the, the this does help where he's got that power and first step quickness, so he can kind of dislodge guys quick off the ball if he gets into them fast. 
Reach blocks going to have a hard time with him on this too because he is so quick off the ball. He times the snap really, really, really well. I think, Brendan, um, one of the better ones in this draft on the defensive line at timing the snaps in addition to a little bit. It makes it that little bit of quickness he has a little bit faster, you know, because you always see him. And I've, I did a couple of moments where I, this is where I started to like him a little bit more because I could hit the kind of pause button, you know, and you do that move where you're like, let me just lock on on who's the first guy off their defensive line every time. And it would often be him, and that's with edges in there, you know. So I thought that that was um, kind of cool. Um, he fires off the ball at ramming speed, and that's what he's doing. He's ramming your gates. There, there's not a lot of other things he's bringing to the table as far as hand fighting or hand usage or counter moves or a plan of attack. He's just looking to ram you kind of back into the backfield. It, it does work. He's got the effort. He can do the cleanup sacks thing. If a quarterback's going to climb the pocket or if the guys he's going past, the quarterback's going right past him, he can pick the QB up there. That's part of why I think he got those sacks this year. He's got good awareness in space. But uh, one year production and still that 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 slowness in space bothers the ever loving s out of me, Brandon Lawrence. It's just like that. Okay, you got that initial quickness, but man, it doesn't sustain it all. And I think you need a little bit of that to sustain at the NFL level. Sometimes, you know, if I need to get him to outside edge plays out of the defensive line, I don't think he he can reach those plays, you know. And and that's where I have some concerns. But I think Seattle met with him. I think they he was one of the guys they they talked with. I think that sounds right. Yeah, I think you're right. But uh, yeah, I like his quickness. I like his agility. A lot of gap shooting stuff that I like. He's got a nice little punch he uses to disengage from blockers. Good with leverage because he's a little bit shorter. But his ability to uh, stack and shed is tough because he's got the short arms. Uh, he's undersized. Bigger linemen are going to dominate him a little bit. So... I'm not, I'm not really sure what to make of this one. I feel like he's meant to be a three tech and an even front so he can shoot gaps. But I do like the fact that he's offering some ability to stuff the run and some ability to rush the passer. So I feel like he's going to find a little bit of success in the NFL. I'd put fifth rounder on him. I put back into the fourth round because I thought that he plays stronger than his size. Some of these guys at 286, 290 play like 290. I think he plays like a 305, 310 guy at 286. Um, and you're right. I think about the, the, the fact that he's, that's that ramming speed thing, right? Brennan is I don't have to get into trying to lock you out and do that. If I just come at you like a missile off the snap, then it, it's not artistic, but then I can get myself out of the troublesome spots of having to deal with hand fighting and that type of stuff. So he's, you're going to have to clean up some things in his game and get him longer. And that's also part of the worry I have with him. Brennan is that you have a, a guy's played five years of ball here and He's not yet developed some of those uh, moves, but he did take a step forward this off this last off season in a draft with a lot of defensive linemen who did not do that. All right. So yeah, that's Marcus Harris. Next guy is a guy who shares a name with a player who went pretty high in the draft last year, which confused the heck out of me for a little bit. Miles Murphy, Miles Murphy of the Tar Heels, North Carolina. A uh, bigger guy, 6'4", 309 pounds, 34, I'm sorry, 33 and 7 eighth inch arms, so pretty long arms. Testing was brutal. Ted didn't test very well, although he is bigger, so you wouldn't exactly expect him to test great. Um, production has been pretty thin the last couple of years, but there's enough here for him to be considered borderline draftable at least. So you think Miles Murphy finds his way to get picked in this upcoming draft. Three years ago, he had a solid season. He was looked at as a real future strong prospect. It's It's been a little bit of a downward trajectory for him. It's not been a complete fall from grace, but it's been a bit of a downward trajectory since then. Um, culminating even with these past testing numbers and not the, the best of seasons. I think he's a, a top heavy nose tackle with really little with very little to offer. He has a smidge of an initial punch that he uses with nice length, but he doesn't bring his feet with him. Um, he becomes almost entirely immobile on contact. He's not stout at the point of attack, which is kind of troublesome if you're going to be a nose tackle. Um, he shows very little awareness in space, even on plays that are near him, even on plays that are near him that he could have an impact on. Now, you see him just completely not aware. Um, and that's a guy that has played a good amount of football now. Very heavy feet on top of them becoming immobile. Um, he's a one-trick pony as a pass rusher with his bull rush, but it is sometimes effective. He gets, all, he gets low off the snap and very adept at winning the leverage war, but his power just isn't as strong. And so when he's asked to two gap, he can't really do that. And even when he wins the leverage war, he still loses, Brendan, if that makes sense. You know, where he does oddly doesn't give him the benefit it would normally give with every other player who would win that. Um, doesn't have any moves, heavily rotated along that defensive line in the games I watched. 
Um, you can move him with a single block at the point of attack, which is a little bit of a cardinal sin for me. If you're a nose tackle, if I see that on tape, I go, <sighs> yeah. So uh, seventh round guy for me. Yeah, I put him in the sixth mostly because I like his size. But yeah, there's not much to his pass rush. Doesn't have lateral agility. Leverage is a problem. I think he's pretty good at shedding blockers because he has decently long arms. And uh, I did like his bull rush like you. I feel like he's going to be like an early down defender in the NFL at best. Like he'll be a capable run defender and give you nothing on passing downs. So I went sixth round. Seventh round is probably more apropos, honestly. But right around there. I just wish I could trust his stoutness in the run game more. That's the part I really like. It, if you want, I'm good with you bringing that one trick as a nose tackle because that's been historically what does come with the the, the 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 nature of the beast here. But that it wasn't better and more consistent on what I was watching on tape, I, it was a little bit strange to me. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, now we're getting down into a couple a couple of these guys you may not have uh, looked at. They're pretty far down. They're pretty uh, deep. I had to do some deep digging to unearth these. So first guy I have is Jaden. Crummity of Mississippi State, a bulldog. Did you mm-hmm. have a chance at uh, this one? I did indeed. <clears throat> okay. 6'4", 301 pounds, 33-inch arms, big hands. Testing was actually above average. Tested okay. Big boards put him – well, ESPN actually has him in the fifth. CBS has him in the seventh. Aggregate has him in the seventh. PFF has him undrafted. So a little all over the place. Production last year was okay. And it was the best he's done in his career. So not really a big numbers guy, but uh, is he anything in the NFL? Well, I, I, I think the first thing to consider with here is this is the Mississippi State defense, right? So this is the defense of Cameron Young last year. And one thing that I learned after watching a lot of the tape with Cameron Young is that it's very hard to evaluate the Mississippi State defensive linemen because they're doing so many games and they're doing so many specific responsibility things playing and play out that have nothing to do with necessarily one gapping or two gapping. You know, it's a lot of scraping and straping and looping and, um, you know, attack, not the gap attack into the shoulder of this player. So this defensive lineman can sweep behind you here. So there's a lot of snaps that you just kind of end up throwing to the wind because of the fact that they're, he's doing a responsibility and it also makes it very hard to evaluate the film on players coming out of the, out of this program, because they're sometimes just doing their responsibility. And it might look like a, a rep loss, Brendan, you know, or it looks like he's, they're doing bad, but the, in the actuality, they're not. Um, I did like the snaps. I did see from him, a very powerful man for the position with just enough athletic bounce. He's got a pro ready rip move, but he goes to it too often. So it gets neutralized because guys start to expect that it's coming. Um, when he lands with his two hands, right coming up into the chest, of the offensive lineman, he can knock them back off their feet. It's not their snap after snap, but I did feel like it did flash with those 33-inch long arms on that 6'5 build, so he's able to bring that a little bit. Four-year starter. He's got a slow burn. He's a slow burn defender with a predator's mentality is what I put in my notes. And what I mean by that, Brennan, is that this is not the quick win guy. This is the guy that he he's going to keep. You know, like, what's that sound the predator makes? You know, he's got that noise it makes when it's tracking and they're doing, they're showing you the predator site. And he's a little bit like that where he's always got his predator sight kind of on you so that if he can get back into range to go make the tackle, maybe he's running back across the field 20 yards. Maybe it's just he's fighting and the running back's taking a, a step where he's trying to cut back across the grain and then he's ready to jump on it. But he's always got a kind of a predator's hunting mentality towards trying to find his way back to the ball carrier, even if he's not getting that initial quick win. And this may not seem like the greatest, the biggest of skills, but remember a lot of these guys we've talked about have said, well, he doesn't get the win and it's like a Brandon Dorless. They're going to shut it down. That snap's done. I lost. You know, I'm going to show my belly. I'm going to roll over. And this isn't the kind of guy to me that's going to do that. I, I did like his effort. Um, not a lot of pass rush moves in his bag. He can get washed out in the run game. Um, if his power doesn't lock in right, he's got to lock it in and hit it. But if it don't lock in right, the lineman can get him on the run game and take him for a bit of a ride. But I did like a little bit of potentially some fifth, sixth round area for him, late fifth, maybe early sixth um, for what he brings to the table. Because I think there's a, there, there's a little something here. Yeah, I went fifth round on him. I actually liked him. A lot of power in his punches. I like the way he sheds blockers. I like his bull rush. I like his understanding of leverage. I think he's versatile. He can play in a 4-3 or a 3-4, even front, odd front. Um, Holds ground against double teams better than you would expect a guy his size. I think his main issue is just he plays too aggressively, and sometimes he gets put out of position because of it, and he doesn't offer a lot as a pass rusher. 
Um, he'll probably be one of those early down guys who comes out on passing plays, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that he'll be good enough in that role to be worth a fifth round pick. So I kind of liked him a little more than I thought I would. So yeah, Jacob Crumity, I like what he's bringing. He had fun tape. Some of these guys didn't have as fun a tape. This guy's tape was a lot more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Uh, next guy is going to be Fabian Lovett of Florida state, the Seminoles. Did not test, so he's big. We know that. He's got 35 and a half inch arms, which is a breath of fresh air in this class after looking at some of these other guys. <laughs> True. I think he I think he has the longest arms of any defensive lineman this year. I, I do believe that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But general ESPN is the only big board that has him getting drafted. So what do you what do you make of him? Um, nothing really exciting here with him. Run defending defensive tackle. His background was mainly used as the, the three tech, but he, he also had a heavy amount of usage as a nose tackle. Um, against the run, he can both penetrate in two gap. When two gapping, he shows plus strength and then has the arm length to still go snatch the ball carrier. You know, one of those guys that you can, you know, he's locked up and the ball carrier's out here and you go, man, he's not going to be able to make that tackle. And he just kind of pulls that big old hook out and sort of hooks the ball carrier as he's going past. You got a lot of those on his snaps of times of that happening. Um, He's not so much about getting rid of the block, but dealing with the block and still making the tackle. You know, he's a lot of those guys too, like all of his tackles on tape are going to be the lineman still on and blocking Brennan. And then he's getting to the ball carrier. And as he's making the tackle, he's still being blocked, you know, versus the guy that like, you know, sl slaps off the hands, gets free really quickly off the snap. And he's in the backfield wreck and shop right off the jump. So he's not going to give you a lot of quick, easy, fast, early wins. Um, as a pass rusher, there's very little there. Um, over nearly a thousand pass rush snaps over his career, he has five total snacks, five total sacks, and only six quarterback hits. Um, he knows how to use his long arms. I'll give him that. He's not one of those guys that got the long arms, doesn't know what to do with them. I like that. But uh, I think there's some limitations to his upside. Fairly straightforward outlook on this guy. He's a three tech um, who becomes at best an early rundown defender. Um, and then you're taking him off the field as a pass rusher. There's no, there is no pass rush upside here for me with him. And that, that put him into the sixth round for me. Yeah, I ended up going fifth round here because I think there's a little bit of upper level potential here because of the long arms. But yeah, no pass rush stuff. Didn't produce in college really at all. But I like the way he moves. I like his punch. I think he anchors down really well. He, his lower body strength is going to allow him to do some leg drive stuff as well. He can take on a double team and hold up. So you might even be able to play him a little bit at nose tackle. I think that might work fairly well. Mm -hmm. So I went fifth round, but um, right, right, not too different from what you had. And he did do some of that nose tackle in college. So yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right on that. That still will be something that can translate to the pros. Mm -hmm. um, next guy I had here, I didn't see him on your list. It's Jawan Briggs, I think is how you pronounce it. Did you look at this guy? I did not look at Jawan Briggs. Mm -hmm. uh, Cincinnati Bearcat, 6'1", 297. Didn't test. PFF likes him quite a bit. Been decently productive the last couple of years for Cincinnati. Had six tackles for loss last year. Uh, he's got a nice punch that he uses to win battles in the trenches. I like the way he sheds blockers. I think he's pretty good at um, finding ways to get off guys that have latched on him. Pretty good tackler as well. He's also got enough strength to hold the edge against the run. And he's really skilled with his hands. But he also has the short arms that make me wonder how much of this stuff translates to the NFL. I don't know if a lot of it's going to work because it it's just a different challenge to have to face guys that are physically so much bigger. Doesn't have a lot of athleticism, not going to be a big threat on passing downs. Misdirection seems to get him. He kind of bites on the first thing he sees. He falls for the eye candy. So rotational defensive lineman to basically play on early down. So sixth round for me, that's what I had. Okay. And my final guy here on the defensive line. And I think you had this guy higher than I did. I think you liked him quite a bit. Logan Lee, Logan Lee of Iowa, 24, 6, 5, 281, 32 and a quarter arms. Testing was actually really notable. Uh, he had some incredible scores in his testing and uh, been productive for Iowa's defense the last couple of years, over 110 tackles over the last two years. So uh, what did you think about Logan Lee? I think Logan Lee's being underrated a little bit in this draft, quite frankly, Brendan. I mean, when we live in a world where um, Braden Fisk is being elevated into places being talked about in the first round, I think this is a player that gives you very similar skill set to Braden Fisk. Um, like Braden, a little, little um, lighter than the normal three tech you'd normally look for, but he's like Braden all effort all the time. 
Um, he is strong enough to hold his ground at the point of attack and quick enough to provide some pass, some pressure. His arms were just a little bit longer than uh, than Braden, so I thought he had held up even a little bit better than Braden at that point. He's not the mover quite that Braden is, but he's also not super far from where Braden tested either. Um, I think he's developed a variety of pass rush moves, including a bull rush where he grabs up under the arms, a rip, a sly swim move, two-handed swipe, and even more. So I think he's a fairly accomplished technician for the position coming out. Um, certainly his lack of girth can get him, you know, taken for the ride in the run game. And sometimes he can't overrun his gap integrity, but he'll give you all he's got every single play. That's where to me, it's like with Braden, I go, well, this guy will put him in a couple rounds past Braden, but if Braden's being considered at this value point, I don't know why this guy isn't also at least in the neighborhood, why he should be somehow in some different city as though he's on a different plane of existence. When I didn't see that big of a difference between the two players, um, he's got counter moves in his bag. Um, he can become a little inactive as a pass rusher if he does get uh, fully neutralized. But um, it seems if you have questions with him as a pass rusher, only being that there's nine sacks in three years, he does give you a strong floor projecting out to be a strong run defender as a pro. With his hand usage and tech technical expertise, I feel like he can still find production as a pass rusher too long term. Um, he won't light the world on fire in this respect, but I think he'd be active and grab a share of high motor sacks and provide an overall well-rounded finished product. I had him for a while, even tempted to put him into the third round. I will stick him into the fourth round, but I do like him into that fourth round um, because I think that he's got some legit skill. Yeah, I just found him to be a little undersized and not quick enough to maneuver around blockers in the way that Fisk is. He doesn't have the quick twitch that I think Fisk has, but I do think he's powerful. I like his explosiveness and agility. I think he's a good amount of strength. He's a good 3-4 fit, theoretically. Um, I think I ended up putting, yeah, I think I had him in the fifth. So, um, I'll, I'll maybe take another look at him and try to see if I can see some of the things that you saw, but I liked him decently marginally. I think the thing to consider here with Fisk is that negative to the arm length thing, which is being kind of overlooked is something he can't get over or get around and where, yeah, you want 33 inches. This little guy's got well over an inch longer arms and you feel his use of length better than what you get from Fisk. So Fisk has got him, like you say, built on the beat on maybe the quickness um, and, and some of that and some of the explosiveness maybe purely, but he does, this guy's got a little bit more ability to be able to stand in there and, and stand kind of toe to toe and maybe two gap a little bit more than what you're able to do with Fisk. And that's where mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying he's a better, Fisk is, deserves to be the better, slightly better prospect, but I don't think he's far away either. All right. That sounds fair. Uh, Upo, thank you for the $10 super chat. Defensive line, Mount Rushmore. Reggie White, Aaron Donald, who else you got? Bruce Smith, Joe Green, Deacon Jones, J.J. Watt, Alan Page. Thanks for all the content, guys. Go Hawks. That's a good question. Uh, it sort of depends on if Lawrence Taylor is considered an edge uh, or a defensive lineman or not. And if you're not, you know, because if he's more out, you're going, well, he's an edge. That's not defensive lineman yeah. here, then he wouldn't be included. Yeah, didn't the Giants run a 3-4? Yeah. That year he, because he Bill was, Parcells was a 3-4 guy. Yeah, so he was he was more of an edge. Um, so I would say Aaron Donald earned his way into being in there. Um, this, yeah. I think that guy was for as long as he was dominant. You have to give him his his flowers. Reggie White's the guy that's talked about time and time again as the guy in his generation that people go to, you know, over and over again um, as a guy off a, as a defensive end uh, that I'd have to probably put in there. <sighs> Deacon's hard. Because he's so old school on that, yeah. But certainly has a right to be in there. And honestly, I'd put him over JJ Watt because Deacon was at a time where they weren't read, even team keeping back keeping track of sacks. Yeah, um, I've always been a big Allen Page guy. I've always liked him a lot. Former Viking, he's a really good player. Former Viking is mm -hmm. a good player. Uh boy, I don't know. It's it's tough on this one. I would definitely put Donald and and White. Um, I mean, Smith and Joe Green might be my two that I would I would put. I'd have to think about if there's somebody else uh, as an end that would work more. But it's hard to think of anybody else that would be uh, a better a better guy to go to than that. So, um, I mean, Joe Green was probably the guy a lot more people thought is the best all time three tech in the game before Donald kind of came in here and swooped in. And with Watt, just not quite. Watt was great, but I can't quite ascend him up into that into that well Watt just kept getting hurt like if he didn't have yeah. the injuries he'd probably be here yeah i agree with that totally agree with that yeah I'm, I'm i'm thinking here i'm trying to think about it here like uh who's the best like nose tackle of all time would you say holy shoot uh 
probably one of those old school guys is probably the best answer on this. Um, but shoot, man, I don't. I oh I oh uh, I don't know. Maybe that cowboy guy. God, is the oh too tall? No, no, it's the other guy. At the he, he wouldn't be a one. He'd be a three tech today. But it was the uh, got the mustache. Why guy with the mustache? Oh, uh, um, God, I can't remember his name. I can't believe I'm, I'm spacing on him like this. Steve Entman. <laughs> Would have been. Randy White. There we go. Thank you. I think Randy was a, I think Randy was a nose. Um, it's going back to the 80s on my thought with this, but I, I think you almost have to go back that time to think of one because it's, you know, a lot of these guys in the 90s and 2000s, Gilbert Brown, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, Russell Maryland with the Cowboys or it's the the New England guy they had for years like really good players but would you put them as your all-time um brush more guys you know not unless you yeah. had to, unless you were forced to do a, a nose tackle you probably wouldn't right yeah I was just thinking about it along those lines for a second but yeah I think that it's Reggie White Aaron Donald and then I'm tempted to go Joe Green and Alan Page there you go. Right. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Yeah, on any not really. Uh, thank I you, Ubo. Yeah, thank you, Ubo. I can't think of any other uh, ends, defensive ends, and I'm going through my mind too with who who there was out there, a defensive tackle, and nobody's super jumping out that uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> I don't think we're forgetting. I'm sure the chat's like, this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Green 80, thank you for the $14 Canadian. Late to the party. Sorry, guys. Sounds like the intensity will be high in Seattle this season. Iron sharpens iron. Go Hawks. I can Go get Hawks. behind that. Go Hawks, Green 80. And uh, yeah, I think uh, iron sharpening iron is a little bit of speaking towards, I think you're going to see an intensity in practice amped up. I think you're going to see more hitting and more of a willingness to try to make sure that they're prepping people, even if at the maybe risk of injury, which I'm willing to do. If I've got a risk injury and that's the only way to do it, to get these guys prepped for for the season and the physicality of the season and to tackle properly then so be it. That's what it takes. And if one guy or two guys goes down because you got to go that way, then I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, now um, I saw this uh, one uh, I saw this one tweet that I thought was really good. Um, Mike McDonald now has something in common with Howard Schultz. <laughs> What's that? They've both taken basketball away from Seattle. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I know they made a big old deal. I like, did their social media post that you felt yeah. like they were going to like cast like a dark shadow and like the silhouette of the hoop still there or something the way that they were they yeah. a little tear, tear going down the eye of the reporters. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, you know, you don't try to be like Pete Carroll, be your own man. I, I completely agree with that a philosophy, regardless of whether or not people may have liked or not liked the basketball hoop. You know, you got to be your own guy. Don't, don't try to be like the guy you're replacing. hundred percent. It's, it's going to come off as fake if you do that. And that's the authenticity you need to have as a coach for them to buy in. And if you are fake, players will smell it from a mile away. And mm -hmm. this is part of going to the new. Uh, Brian Myers, thank you for the $1.99. Cortez Kennedy. I don't think he'd be the Mount Rushmore. He'd be up there. Did some great things, but... Definitely one of the all-time three techs in the sport. I, I think Tez does get behind Donald. I think he's behind um, the, the Steelers, Joe Green. Uh, somebody else has mentioned in the chat, Warren Sapp. I don't think Warren's quite there, but I do think Warren's probably ahead of Cortez Kennedy, not by a, mm -hmm. a, a huge mark and mark here. I mean, Tez has got his argument to be in the, in the name neighborhood with these guys, but Tez is more probably top five for a three tech all time. I mean, he's, he's more in there with the John Randall, at level of where he's at than he is with the the, the upper crust to me quite what, upper crust. what was the guy on the 85 bears uh the the three tech on the 85 bears was that richard Randy dent? michael richard dent no richard dent yeah richard dent he he uh had an insane playoff run that year but actually you look at the rest of his career it wasn't that like shockingly amazing no bears bears were kind of like the, the Legion of Boom a little bit with that defense. It, it came in like a warm gust, blew everybody's socks off, and then whew, it was kind of over very quickly onto the other side of things. Mm -hmm. Green 80, thank you for the $14 yet again. Aaron Donald, Reggie White, Warren Sapp, Miles Garrett. Well, we might be getting there with Miles Garrett. I think we're, uh, we got to wait at least a decade before we start putting that one out there, though. 
Yeah, Garrett's been really, really good from day one. Almost 89 sacks right now in his career. 300 tackles. Uh, got in the league in 2017. So Green, I think that Garrett's on his is on the road to being that guy. If he puts another four years together, five years together of, of at this pace where he's at, and you know at that point that's going to be 140 sacks, then definitely we're going to maybe start to talk about him into that neighborhood of things for sure. Feels like. TJ Watt might be the guy who piles up the most numbers from this era. Mm -hmm. Well, he definitely will if you put in the the coverage stuff too, right? Because he's yeah. good. He's good in coverage off the edge as a, as a three four end, and that separates him from Garrett, who doesn't do any dropping off to the edge. Um, but he seems to get sort of shaded by players, doesn't he, Brendan? TJ Watt, bit. like he doesn't seem to get the the love you think he would for what he's done in his career. And he came in the same year as as Garrett, and he actually has outproduced him. He's got mm. almost a hundred sacks already yeah. compared to the eighty nine of Garrett, and more tackles. And you know, so you you go, man, I don't understand, you know, why he did, but he just doesn't get that love. So, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Green eighty. Thank you, Green eighty. Very kind of you. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, you had one guy on your list that I did not have on mine, and I couldn't find anything on this guy. Zion Logue. So if Logue. you want to talk Logue. about Logue a little bit, I, I got nothing. But um, if you Zion. got something that's better than my nothing. Zion Logie. Uh He's a Georgia defensive lineman. Uh, that is another little bit of a tough evaluation um, because of how many moving parts go into that defense. Uh, Brendan, just another defense. I think we got noted on some of these defenses, right? You remember it being talked about, about with Carter and Nolan last year, right? It's been going on, even going back to Trayvon Walker, where it's like, we can't look at his numbers because they do so many things in their defense with the blitz game and some of the, the what they're running with the games up front that it's, again, a responsibility thing. It's a bit of the Mississippi State stuff to a lesser degree, I would say. Um, it's not necessarily the same defense, but just in that you ask your defensive lineman to a responsibility more than to beating their man um, time and time again. Um, uh, he is, uh, so um, a lot of movie parts, you get stuck on assignment. You don't get to be purely unleashed. I think that sometimes happened to him a lot where he was just asked to take up blockers and let other guys get the work done. I think he's a three tech, um, but he's been asked to do a lot of stuff at the edge, like a Red Bryant four or five tech roll of old, right? Early downs, you set the edge strong. Um, and he has been a strong run defender. Damn hard to get him rooted out of his spot when he sunk in. But this is obviously with him coming off the edge at 6'6", 314. And there's not going to be many tackles that are going to root you out at that size. He does have some lateral bounce for his size, but he's not very explosive. And he loses power when he's going sideways. Um, has some good bend for his size and works to get the leverage war win. It helps him on his slow slow burn bull rush and that does take time, but does work. Um, doesn't really offer any hand fighting or moves. Um, loses leverage with 6'6 six, six a lot. Can't get low. Doesn't have a lot of explosiveness at his size, even when you kick him inside from outside. Has a lot of those outside snaps, though, of course. Um, I think he can be a little bit of a run stuffing three tech. You might be able to snag yourself in a sixth, seventh round spot, surprisingly, because teams will overlook him because so many of those snaps, he's eating up that responsibility approach, which I think will drag him down. But there's some physical stuff to him that could be interesting. All right. All right. Uh, what round would you put him in? Oh, it'd still go seventh. So mm. I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't take any other risk because he he's, he's gives you not really any kind of pass rush. It's only in the run stuff. And then the run stuff, you're not sure it's going to translate because there's so many snaps off the edge. It's not just purely running off the three tech inside of Georgia. All right. Uh, we had one more nose tackle that was on both of our lists. It's uh, Justin Rogers of Auburn. Mm -hmm. uh, six foot two and a half, 330 pounds, 33 inch arms. Combine was kind of an embarrassment, but he's a nose tackle, so it's a little more okay. PFF likes him quite a bit. They have him in the fifth. Um, had a pretty decent couple years for Auburn. Uh, 2022, he had 35 tackles, part of a pretty decent Auburn defense that year, I think. Mm. But uh, didn't really build on it in 2023. So um, what, do you, what do you make of Justin Rogers? Uh, tree trunk, nose tackle. He's slow motion off the snap, in my opinion. I mean, Brendan, 24 and a half inch vertical leap. Like I can beat that by six, six inches and I can't jump. Um, eight, three broad, almost, you know, getting up there in that five territory as far as his shuttle. Um, he's got decent power, long enough arms for the smaller build that he brings the position, but he just doesn't root down well enough. He doesn't, he gets too driven far out of the hole too many times. Always, a, always backwards a few steps after the snap, in my opinion. Um, as a pass rusher, you'll find buses arriving more timely to the quarterback. There's He's not getting there. Uh, a lot of hand fighting, very little plan of attack, just tries to get by with effort. You know, it's just slow out of a stance, no quickness to offer when he does get moving. 
Uh, I'm not really sure what he provides the NFL. This is my lowest rated defensive lineman of the ones that we've evaluated. Yeah, um, I think he's a decent meat and potatoes nose tackle. He's good with leverage, really hard to uproot off his spot, good power in his hands, can survive a double team, but he doesn't shed through blockers. He's not quick. He's not explosive. No pass rush value, really. Can't move laterally. So he's just kind of a prototypical narrow use case nose tackle. I wouldn't mind taking him in like the sixth round personally. Yeah, I just I I instantly soured on him. He just was not not for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean this kind of player is starting to go extinct in the modern NFL, right? This is the kind of guy who's like only good on rundowns. Um, it, it, it's tough. Yeah, only good on rundowns and can move. You know, because mm -hmm. so much of the run game is getting lateral and having to actually get your your big butt out there in space and get to the spot. All right. I did look at a few more nose tackles, although I don't know if any of them are actually going to get drafted or not because their stock is pretty low. But uh, let me know if you had a chance to take a look at any of these guys. We had Jordan Jefferson from LSU. Nope. Um, uh, he's uh, been fairly productive for LSU the last couple of years. He shoots gaps okay, better than you would expect a guy this size to do. Uh, he has a pretty good... Uh, he launches off the ball quickly. His first step is kind of nice, launching into contact. Uh, he's got a lot of strength. He's probably going to be a better pro than he was in college. Um, I kind of wonder if maybe he'll end up playing like a three-tech role in the NFL because I feel like his best asset is breaking into the backfield with his first step and shooting the gap. So even though he played nose tackle in college but with Wingo and uh, um, Mason Smith, he uh, might actually benefit from a uh, different perspective on him. He might actually end up being a better three tech type, but I put a fifth round value on him. Oh, interesting guy stuck behind two guys that are getting drafted. So, you know, sometimes those guys, you know, it's not their fault. They're not better than the guys got drafted. Doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily have something to potentially offer. Uh, this next guy is a guy the Seahawks actually met with for a top 30 visit. So I, at least worth looking into a little bit. Christian Boyd of Northern Iowa. Um, 6'4", 317 pounds, 31 and a quarter arms, which is brutal. <laughs> he did crank out 39, 30, excuse me, 38 bench press reps though. So, you know, when you have the short arms, it's a little bit easier, but he, he did it. Uh, decent production last year. A lot of power, uh, strong punches, sinks the hips. But no pass rush moves to speak of. No, not quick, not agile. And given how he played in college, I think that short arm length might kill him in the NFL. Not many guys I don't think operate with that thirty-one inch inch long arms inside. So it's it is possible, but you got to bring some kind of extra great trait to the table that can overcome that at that point. Mm -hmm. And the last guy I looked at was Evan Anderson of Florida Atlantic. You familiar with him at all? I couldn't find any tape on that one of uh, Florida Atlantic. Yeah, he's actually kind of explosive. He's got a little bit of pass rush ability to him. A um, little bit of an ability to actually make some penetration stuff happen. He roots down and he's really hard to move off his spot. Um, the measurements I posted on screen are the ones on his NFL draft buzz page. And a lot of people say they're actually inaccurate and he's actually like 6'3", 350, which is a oh big difference. That's a little bit of a discrepancy. So I don't know, maybe the measurements were taken when he was 12 years old or something, but um, we, we need confirmation here. We need him. We need uh, somebody to go to his house with a scale. Uh, it's a, we got to, we got to breach the gap here one way or the other, brother. But um, I kind of liked him. I'd say sixth round value. I think his short arms are going to be a little bit of a problem, but I like his explosiveness. I like his first step. And um, there, there's some interesting stuff here with the Evan Anderson for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not much Florida Atlantic tape lingering around. To yeah. Run. Um, did you have anybody else that we didn't cover? We got all my guys. All right. So that's the defensive line. That's what we got. Um, we did really good. So, um, yeah, it's not the best defensive line draft, but there's a lot of depth to it. There's a lot of quality middle to it. I think. Yeah, I, I, you got to look at it. I think as we went through it, and I, it kind of hit as we were doing a lot of the summarizing on these guys because I, I had been aware of it, but I went, "Oh yeah, this is really that way." Which is Brendan. It's just there's there's a lot of, um, you know, rotational guys you're getting in this draft a bit, and you just got to make your bones with the fact that it is a little bit rotational. That's okay. Um, 
especially if you're not drafting them high and and that you sit them in that role. The good news is within the rotation you bring them, most of these guys at least have a bit of the four where they'll be solid into that role. You maybe can't look out in the four, forecast him to say that this is a starter down the line even, but that you do have a bit of a role you can slide him into. And I, I, I do think defensive lines really at the end of the day, Brennan, are going as much as ever into this territory of just being more rotational than ever. And when we had our great defensive line 10 years ago, it was the back on of, of a rotational defensive line, right? It was a back on constantly keeping parts and pieces spinning through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember making some videos about how thoroughly we rotated back in 2012 and 2013. And then each year that went by, it got worse and worse and worse until by the end of the LOB era, I think Bennett was playing like 55 snaps a game or something. Yeah. And it, and this was we saw this even last year, right? Where we were leaning our on the guys that did good last year too much. And they, it was wearing out the good parts that early on in the year that were working good got tired because you had to lean on them too heavily. And so it's um, star power is great. You, you need the guys that can be difference makers up front too, but the depth also is is part of what goes into the making a great defensive line here. We've seen that. And um, we've been all too familiar with here in Seattle. So it, it's not bad if we got to go this route on a couple of these guys to fit them into that role. It, it may not bring some of the excitement, some of the other picks do with the upside that you might normally look to get with them, but solid nonetheless. All right. So I think that's going to do it for tonight. Thank you, Brandon, for doing this with me. It was a blast. It was a pleasure to go through these defensive linemen. As my, as it is for me, brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to everybody who showed up for the stream today. Good stream, everybody. Um, I think we're meeting on Saturday and we're doing edge rushers. I think that's right. We're going All edge. Right. And, you know, I think every draft class is thick on edge. I think that's just a position that every year is going to attract a lot. So we got a lot to get through. It's, it's a position that brings the athletes to it in this day and age. It's become one of those ones people want to go and play because you get paid and it's a, a limelight position too. Mm -hmm. So hope to see you guys on Saturday. A little bit of an unusual time for us, but we will be congregating to figure this edge stuff out. Um, see you guys later on. And um, yeah, we're two weeks away, guys. Two weeks away. It's sneaking up on us. It's getting up on us very quickly here. We're almost done with our draft work. We just got a little bit more to get through and we'll have done our homework. We'll have be, we'll be as educated as possible about this draft process. So buckle in, get ready for these last couple weeks and go Hawks. Go Hawks.